Mistletoe Match, No Match for Love. Written by Lindsay Armstrong. Narrated by Tiffany Williams. Chapter 1 The only thing worse than being alone at Christmas was being your cousin's plus one to a work holiday party. Michelle fastened the silver Christmas tree earring into her lobe, making a face in the mirror. Even Luke, the hot mess celebrity she'd briefly dated last year, had managed to find his happily ever after. The pit that had formed in her stomach three hours ago, when she saw Luke and his new wife Brooke on a magazine cover in the store checkout line, hadn't dissipated. She'd done a pretty good job of at least faking contentment the past year, but that photo had brought her loneliness back in full force. Her phone buzzed and she picked it up. A text from Autumn. Drinks tonight at Bobby's. We need a designated driver and I pick you. Michelle laughed, quickly texting back. Can't. I've got the Christmas party with Hudson tonight. Autumn's response was almost immediate. No, we all want you there. We meant the members of Their Only Voice, the animal rights activist group Michelle belonged to. Is Ruth coming? Michelle texted. She'd never gotten along well with a chapter president. If I tell you no, will you come? came Autumn's response. It was oh so tempting, but she had promised Hudson. Sorry, maybe next time. At least tell me you're wearing the red dress, Autumn said. You look amazing in that one. You'll definitely snag a man if you wear it. Michelle glanced down at her dress, the very one Autumn had mentioned, and smirked. We can't all find our Doug, Michelle said. Yeah, but you could at least try. Michelle shut off her phone without replying. She had tried to find a man, really hard and for a really long time. But she'd completely given up this year, hadn't been on a single date. The bell rang and Bella, her ancient beagle, gave a tired yawn. Some guard dog you are, Michelle teased, scratching behind the animal's ears as she walked by. Bella gave a happy bark, her sightless eyes seeing nothing, then settled back into her cushioned bed. Michelle shook her head, a smile tugging at her lips, and headed to the front door. Hey, Hudson said, looking dashing as always in a suit with an incredibly skinny tie. His pants were at least four inches too short and showcased socks with a wild diamond design. He brushed a lock of curly hair out of his eyes. You look nice. Let me guess, you found a new eco-friendly mascara that hasn't been tested on animals. See, you really can tell the difference, Michelle teased. Truthfully, she'd spent 20 minutes perusing the makeup aisle before finding exactly that. You look nice, too. Thanks again for coming with me. If you win that flat screen, I get to pick the first movie we watch on it. You know, you could have just asked a real date to be the extra raffle ticket holder. And risk someone thinking we're serious? No way. Ready to go? Almost. Let me grab my purse. Be right back. But it took her nearly five minutes to search out the black beaded clutch from the dark corner of her closet. She finally found it piled underneath a hemp bra she had forgotten about and a skirt she had bought at a street fair. Found it she called, re-entering the living room. She froze, then grabbed the magazine from Hudson's hands, the one that talked about how Luke and his wife were building their dream home. Since when do you read celebrity gossip? Hudson asked. I don't. It was an impulse buy. Michelle walked into the kitchen and dropped the magazine into the trash can. See? All gone. Are we taking your car or mine? I'll drive, Hudson said. Michelle nodded, ushering him out of the house. Maybe he wouldn't bring up the magazine again. I didn't think you even liked that guy, Hudson said. Michelle sighed, dropping her keys into the clutch. She had met Luke through Toujours, a professional matchmaking agency. Michelle had only gone out with him once to a Broadway production of The Lion King. There had been zero chemistry between them, and she told her matchmaker she wasn't interested in a second date. I didn't like him. Not like that, at least. 
He's nice enough and I'm happy for him. So why the magazine? Hudson held open the car door and she slipped into his silver Prius. I guess I was just curious about his life. Hudson peered at her, his dark eyes hooded with concern. After 29 years, I think I know when you're lying. Are you okay? Of course I am. Why did he have to bring up her age? 29 and still single. She thought she'd be a stay-at-home mom in the suburbs by now, with a garden patch in the backyard and a few chickens to provide fresh eggs. She wanted someone to discuss her day with, someone to make her laugh. Why couldn't she seem to make a relationship work? It wasn't like she dated jerks or commitment phobes or anything. She just hadn't found a guy who felt like her other half. She always fell for the guy who was allergic to dogs, or the guy who was moving across the country, or the guy who didn't want children. One time she dated the perfect man for three months, only to learn he was heading to Africa for a summer of wild game hunting. She'd barely been able to look at him after that. It was why she had signed with Toujours, the matchmaking firm Luke had turned into a household name. But after six months of never making it past the third date, she'd given up and canceled her subscription. That had been New Year's Eve of last year. You can't avoid me by disappearing into your own head, Hudson said, tapping roughly on her forehead. Hey! Michelle swatted his hand away. Focus on the road. Focus on the conversation. Michelle pursed her lips. Hudson turned out of the subdivision and onto the main road, passing the trio of inflatable snowmen with flapping red scarves and happy grins waving from their grassy patch of drive strip. Even the snowmen would spend this Christmas with someone. I'm jealous, okay? Are you happy now? You know I can't be happy if you aren't, Hudson said. Jealous of what? Luke. He was this complete mess when we went out, and now he's got everything I want. The love of his life, the marriage, the house in the suburbs. Private beachfront property isn't exactly a house in the suburbs. Still, Michelle let out a sigh. I'm lonely, okay? Hudson smirked. What, attending work parties with me isn't fulfilling enough? Michelle snorted. Yeah, not really. I know you're happy being single and doing the career thing, but I'm not. Then find someone. You act like I haven't tried. Look, Shell, I know you've dated a lot, and I know it's never worked out. But when you couldn't get the city to agree to a recycling program our junior year, did you just give up? No, you kept at it until they finally caved. I don't think petitioning the city council until they are so sick of hearing from me they agree to my demands will work in this situation. Maybe not, but statistically speaking, if you date enough men, eventually you'll find the one that you want to stick around. Dating is hard. Things always went so incredibly well in the beginning, but within a few months, the illusion shattered. I'm guessing marriage is too. She smacked him on the arm. Geez, thanks for the pep talk. His tone turned serious. You know I love you, right? And right now you need tough love. You've got to stop being scared. If marriage is really what you want, you need to go for it with as much determination as you went after that recycling program. Like the two situations were even comparable. At the hotel... Hudson handed his keys over to a valet and they walked inside the high-rise. A 20-foot-high Christmas tree graced the foyer and printed signs directed guests to the parties happening in the various event rooms. They downgraded this year, Hudson said, pointing to the sign. We're not in the grand ballroom. Dang it. They better still be giving away the flat screen. They found the cascade room already half-filled with people. Christmas music played softly through the speakers, and the cinnamon strudel appetizer smelled divine. Michelle's phone buzzed. Collecting signatures next weekend for the cosmetic testing bill we're backing, Autumn texted. Can you take a shift? The library is letting us set up a table. Sure, Michelle quickly texted back. 
Hammond Cosmetics announced they're filing bankruptcy, came another text. Looks like our smear campaign worked. Ruth's ecstatic. Another point to humanity. Michelle barely held back a squeal. They'd worked tirelessly for nearly a year exposing the inhumane practices the cosmetic company had used on their animal test subjects. Hopefully, they'd achieve the same results with Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, another company that refused to end animal testing, very soon. They're getting chintzy this year. Hudson pointed to the table decorations. Pine cones? Lame. Michelle tucked her phone back in her clutch. They can't do tiny Christmas trees as centerpieces two years in a row. As long as I win the flat screen, I don't care. You never win, and you complain about it every year. Yeah, but bringing you gives me double the chances. Michelle rolled her eyes. Hudson wrapped an arm around her. Seriously, Shell, are you okay? You still seem off. I'm fine. I'm just thinking about all the tests I need to grade, and I have a new student coming on Monday. Did I tell you that? No, but that's cool, Hudson said. Seriously, I can take you home if you aren't up for this tonight. And chance you missing out on that flat screen? Not a chance. Ten minutes into the mediocre and semi-cold dinner, Hudson started flirting with a petite waitress with almond-shaped eyes and silky black hair. He tried to bring Michelle into their conversation, but after her billionth one-word reply, he gave up and focused on the waitress. When a waiter who was actually doing his job came by with a bottle of champagne, Michelle nodded and let him fill up her glass. Twice. She missed dating. Not the awkward first dates or the uncomfortable pseudo-breakups, but the part where they were just beginning to be comfortable with each other, where things were still exciting and new. She missed the closeness and familiarity of another person, the camaraderie of a relationship. And okay, she totally missed kissing. Ugh. Wasn't the waitress's boss going to come by and yell at her for slacking? Michelle sighed and rose from the table, stumbling a bit before steadying herself. Where are you going? Hudson asked, tearing his eyes away from the waitress. Restroom, she said. He started to rise as well. Are you okay? I can find the bathroom on my own. Sit down so you don't miss the raffle. Here. She handed him her ticket. I'll be back soon. Michelle wandered into the hallway, breathing a sigh of relief as the noise of the party grew faint and fuzzy. She had to stop feeling sorry for herself. Being the crazy cat lady wouldn't be so bad. She giggled. Did cat ladies have dogs? Or did that make Bella a cat? She didn't need a man to be happy. She had Bella, the best dog a girl could ask for, their only voice, a cause worth fighting for, and Hudson, her best friend. That was more than enough. She spotted a restroom and slipped inside, claiming the first empty stall. Guys just created messes, and she cleaned up enough of those at school. The warm water from the sink washed away the soap as resolve filled her. Time to stop feeling sorry for herself. She had a great job and a great life. And tonight, she had all the free champagne she could drink. That was more than enough. Uh, hi, a deep voice said beside her. Michelle jerked, splashing water all over her dress. Why was there a man in the women's restroom? She giggled and backed against the sink. How embarrassing for him. Restroom. What a weird word. It wasn't like there were chairs to rest on. Something white caught her gaze. Porcelain. Why were there urinals in here? Crap. Oh my gosh. Michelle put a hand to her forehead, another giggle bursting forth. This is the men's restroom, isn't it? A smile lifted one corner of his mouth. His face was covered in a closely shaved beard, accenting his narrow cheekbones and angular face. Yeah, it is. Yummy. He was handsome as sin. I'm so sorry, 
Michelle grabbed a paper towel and scrubbed her hands dry, another giggle escaping before she jetted back into the hallway, the man close on her heels. The men's bathroom. Jeez. Don't worry about it. I walked into a women's restroom at the airport last week. Happens to all of us. He'd probably caused those women to have heart attacks. Broad shoulders filled out his tux in a way that had her heart thumping in her chest from more than embarrassment. His dark chocolate hair was streaked with gray, and he looked perhaps nine or ten years older than her, with the faintest of crow's feet near his smiling eyes. Eyes that were the exact same shade as his hair. Her mouth went dry, and she swallowed. No more thinking about men. Bad, Michelle. She cleared her throat. He had to be at least six foot four inches, and she wasn't used to looking up at a man. So you wander into women's restrooms frequently? I feel like there's a name for that. He laughed, and the sound sent shivers down her body. After that 80-year-old woman hit me with a purse, I can promise you I do my best to avoid those kinds of mistakes. I check the sign outside restrooms at least three times before going in. I guess I should start doing the same. She glanced at his left hand. No ring. There must be something wrong with him. No way a guy this hot was still single without a reason. Do you work at Morgan Accounting? The man blinked. I'm sorry? She motioned down the hallway to the open doors. The Christmas party. Oh, no, I'm attending a party in the grand ballroom. I stepped into the hallway to take a phone call. She swayed toward him before quickly correcting her balance. Why couldn't she stop giggling? I should probably let you get back to your date. I decided to risk the gossip and come alone. He smiled, and that one small action transformed his entire face. Suddenly, his chocolate eyes sparkled with flecks of caramel that had her stomach doing backflips. What about you? Tricked into coming by my cousin Hudson. He's really committed to winning that flat-screen TV they're giving away. I'm his extra raffle ticket. Ah, so it appears we're both on our own. Yeah, it does. Michelle cocked her head to the side, eyeing him. Maybe what she needed was one last fling with a stranger before hanging up her dating hat for good. She really missed kissing, and his lips looked absolutely delicious. He grinned and took a step forward, as though reading her mind. His eyes were all melty and beautiful and made her insides a puddle of goo. She took a deep breath, then plunged, the pleasant champagne buzz giving her courage. I need a few more minutes of reprieve before I head back into the craziness that is that party. I was going to take a walk in the gardens. Care to join me? I thought you'd never ask. I'm sorry, I don't even know your name. Michelle. She tucked a strand of hair self-consciously behind her ear. She couldn't believe she had just asked him out. Sort of. Whatever it was, he'd agreed. Austin. He extended a hand and she shook it, heat racing up her arm at the contact. Shall we? Shall we. Two such simple words, and yet they felt like the beginning of a promise. In the gardens, the December air gently rustled the trees covered in glowing Christmas lights. A cobblestone pathway led to a gazebo strung with garland and lights. Picture perfect. When was she going to wake up? So, Michelle, if you aren't an employee at Morgan Accounting, then what exactly do you do? I'm a teacher. This will be my seventh year. Ah. Austin's mouth curved up in a smile and her heart hammered against her ribcage. I already know I like you. I could never be a teacher, but I really admire those who can. Helping my kids with homework is plenty of teaching for me. So, he had kids. That meant there was an ex somewhere in the picture. I can't imagine doing anything else as a career. I love everything about it. She gave a small laugh. Well, okay, I wouldn't mind a bigger paycheck, but who can't say that about their job? 
Sometimes I think I'd happily take a smaller paycheck if it meant less responsibility. And what is it that you do? I'm a businessman. He squeezed her hand, exerting the barest of pressure. I get to come to parties like this and meet beautiful women like yourself and get paid for it. Such a vague answer. One that had her struggling not to smile. How long had it been since someone flirted with her? I prefer the term mysterious. Here. He slipped off his tuxedo jacket and draped it around her shoulders, his hands lingering. You looked cold. Thank you. Michelle clutched the lapels tightly around her shoulders, discreetly sniffing the jacket. Mercy. Cinnamon and apples. This guy smelled like Christmas. Austin cleared his throat and took a step back. So, did your cousin win the flat screen? They hadn't given it away yet when I left. They were in the middle of the door prizes when I had to step into the hallway. He took her hand and gently tucked it into the crook of his arm. I think I won anyway. She was going to fall right out of her flats. The butterflies were making her so unstable. Thank heaven she hadn't worn heels, although he was tall enough she could have. If this is what happened when she wandered into the wrong bathroom, she was going to try it more often. Maybe she'd hold off on getting a cat after all. They walked into the pavilion at the end of the walking path and stared out at the small koi pond. Moonlight reflected off the surface, making Austin's eyes sparkle even more. So, Michelle, what's your story? What do you mean? I mean, what is a beautiful woman like you doing at a Christmas party with her cousin? Surely you've got someone else to spend time with. She reminded herself to breathe. Not at the moment. Then we're in the same boat. He took a step toward her, the heat across the millimeters between them a physical fire. His eyes flicked upward, and she followed his gaze. Huh, he said. Mistletoe. You don't say. The words sounded breathy, even to her own ears. In medieval England, it was considered bad luck not to kiss if caught under the mistletoe. Thank you, ridiculous superstitions. Seems like an unwise way to start the new year. Or to end one. Slowly, he reached out and grasped her arms, pulling her toward him. His eyes locked onto hers, seeming to search for some sign of hesitance. She took a step closer. A smile lingered on his lips and he lowered his head, pausing a hair's breadth away. Michelle let her eyes drift closed and bridged the distance. His lips were the exact perfect mix of plump and firm. She melted against him, and somehow his jacket slipped off her shoulders. Her hands buried into his incredibly soft hair. A hand pressed against her back, urging her closer as he deepened the kiss and she eagerly responded. His scruff rubbed against her cheek, and she barely held back a shiver at the delicious sensation. It had been so long since she had been held close by anyone. So long since she had been kissed. This moment was absolutely perfect. Maybe he'd ask her out, and they'd spend the next six months volunteering at the animal shelter on weekends, and... What on earth was she thinking? She didn't know this man from Adam. The pleasant fuzz of alcohol began to fade, and confusion took its place. She pulled away, breathless from the intensity of affection after so long without it. I can't believe I just did that she said. I'm not usually that type of girl. I wouldn't mind doing it again. Michelle put a hand to her hair, trying to steady her breathing. If she continued down this path, the perfect moment would be stolen from her when things came to their inevitable end. I'd better get back to the party. Can I at least have your number? She wanted to give it to him, but she wanted to preserve this perfect moment even more. One perfect moment in a sea of broken ones. She had a plan, and she was sticking to it. She'd had her fling. Now she was done with men for good. 
It was very nice meeting you, Austin. Very nice. Impulsively, she pulled him toward her for one last lingering kiss. Then she turned and ran from the garden. Chapter 2 Austin stuck his hands in his pockets, watching Michelle sprint out of the garden and out of his life. He shouldn't have kissed her, but Victoria's call had left him feeling vulnerable and he had been caught up in the magic of the moment. He let Michelle go, despite every molecule in his body commanding him to run after her. Just because Victoria was doing her best to make him miserable didn't give him a free pass to kiss random strangers. Running into Michelle had felt like a Christmas present just for him, and he had been more than willing to go after the rebound. Except, that kiss hadn't felt like a rebound. It had felt like a part of his soul was finally whole. What had started out as an attempt to forget the disaster that was his life had quickly morphed into a real desire to get to know Michelle better. She hadn't felt like a random stranger but a friend he'd reconnected with after a long time apart. A friend he very much wanted to spend more time kissing. She'd molded into his body like they were two halves of a whole. Austin let his gaze flick to a shadowy corner of the garden, his anxiety heightening. He could just make out the silhouette of someone hiding behind a large willow tree, almost completely concealed by the shadows and branches. He hadn't considered a reporter might follow him into the garden, but a split second after kissing Michelle, he'd caught the flash of a camera lens. At least the firestorm he'd walked into when accepting the job from Wellsprings Pharmaceutical was localized to the surrounding community and the local press. Victoria was unlikely to hear about the kiss. He stooped down, swiping his tuxedo jacket off the pavilion floor and giving it a shake. He slipped the jacket back on and brushed at his lapels. The coat was still warm from Michelle's body and smelled faintly of watermelon. It had been a long time since he had been so instantly attracted to a woman. Austin waited in the garden for another five minutes, giving Michelle time to escape back to the Christmas party without another awkward run-in. Then, even though he wanted nothing more than to seek her out and beg for her number, Austin walked back into the grand ballroom. Jeannie, his high-strung personal assistant, was at his side the second he entered. Where have you been? Mark wants to introduce you to the company, then give you a few minutes to speak to the employees. I had to take care of something, Austin said. Michelle was somewhere in the building. Every nerve ending called to her. I'm ready now. Jeannie spoke into her headset, then glanced up at him. You're up in five. Austin nodded trying to hide the exhaustion seeping into every pore of his body. He'd loved his position as marketing director of his father-in-law's medical supply company. But he had given up the job when Victoria gave up on their marriage. He never should have proposed to her. Doubts had whispered to his mind while they were dating, but the heady excitement of new love ultimately clouded his judgment. He'd wanted so badly to believe her when she professed to wanting nothing more than to settle down and start a family. It hadn't taken long after Mariah's birth to realize that free-spirited Victoria wasn't the mothering type. After finding out about Roberto, Victoria's boyfriend, Austin hadn't contested the divorce. It's been a rocky year here at Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, Mark said from the front of the room. He looked out of place in a suit and tie instead of his usual flip-flops and cargo shorts. He was young for a CEO, close to Austin's own 40 years, but he commanded a room like a man with twice as much experience while maintaining the laid-back attitude of a frat boy. Their only voice has decided to take on the role of playground bully, and unfortunately, we've been their victim. But they can't keep us down for long. We are still here for you. The crowd went wild at the company slogan, and Mark held up a hand until the room had quieted back down. We donated $1 million to charitable institutes this past year. Stock is up 5%, and last week we announced we've hired a top-rated marketing director to make sure that next year is beyond awesome. 
Let's hear it for Austin O'Neill. Here we go, Austin thought. He took a deep breath, then plastered on a smile and waved to the crowd as he made his way through the round tables dotting the ballroom. Cameras flashed from the back, where the local media had been invited to cover the event at Austin's recommendation. No time like the present to try and sway public opinion in their favor. The previous marketing director had made a tense situation infinitely worse with his attitude around the press. Being caught on camera nearly running over a dog had been the last straw. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, everyone, Austin said. I'm excited and eager to be here. Well, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration. His three children had been less than thrilled when he announced last month that they were moving from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. They'd all asked why they couldn't stay with their mother in Nevada. Austin hadn't told them it was because she didn't want the responsibility. After their phone call, he had a pretty good idea why. In January, the happy adulterers were moving to Brazil because it sounded like fun. At least she'd agreed to come down in a few weeks and take the kids to Santa's village. Victoria finally had her life of freedom, and she wasn't about to let motherhood ruin that. Awesome. Christmas lights twinkled all along the ballroom, and candles flickered in the middle of the tables. Austin gave his prepared speech, trying to focus on the positive while being mindful of how the media would try to twist his words. At the end of the day, he couldn't change the fact that he was the marketing director of a pharmaceutical company that still did testing on animals, something their only voice refused to let the community forget. But Wellsprings did everything in accordance with FDA guidelines, and animal testing helped people. Austin would calm the public's concerns while helping them realize that Wellsprings was actually the good guy. Applause followed him off the stage at the end of his speech. If nothing else, he didn't think he had given the media any more ammunition. Mark, on the other hand... Austin had seen the numbers, and he knew Mark exaggerated the stock numbers, not outright lied, but hadn't given the whole truth either. Stock was up 5% overall, but it had fallen 3% in the last quarter. And it was mostly due to public perception thanks to their only voice's merciless campaign. His first order of business would be to arrange a meeting with the animal rights group and see if he couldn't smooth some ruffled feathers. At the very least, it would be a good opportunity to assess how deep the damage actually went. The party dragged on for an eternity, but at last Austin made his escape and drove to his new home in the city of Yorba Linda. His neighbors' houses were all resplendent in Christmas lights, but Austin's remained dark. He thanked Lucy, a college student he had hired to help out, for staying late, then wandered into the kitchen and grabbed a glass of water. Daddy? Austin set his glass on the counter and crouched down next to his seven-year-old, Sydney. What are you doing out of bed? he asked, ruffling her hair. I wanted you to sing me a song good night. Well then, that's what I'll do. He picked her up and she clung to his neck. Austin kissed her soft cheek and carried her up the stairs. Why didn't Victoria realize what she was missing out on, what she was giving up? Austin had made his peace with the fact that Victoria was more interested in her much younger personal trainer than in the man she had spent 16 years married to, but he would never forgive her for abandoning their children as well. Austin gently laid Sydney in her bed and stroked her hair. What song would you like tonight? The one about shooting stars. Austin nodded and started singing his own favorite childhood song, one he was pretty sure his mom had made up. Sydney's eyes drifted closed, and Austin kissed her on the forehead. He peered into Spencer's room and saw the boy sprawled across his Iron Man comforter, once again sleeping on top of the sheets instead of under them. Austin slowly opened the door, wincing when the hinge squeaked. He picked up the blanket that had been tossed to the floor and gently laid it over his son. Next, Austin walked across the hall and peered in on Mariah. Her bedroom walls were covered with pictures of boy bands, but at least she was asleep in her bed instead of glued to her phone, eagerly awaiting texts from friends. 
When had she morphed from his sweet little girl into this hormonal 13-year-old he rarely understood? Mariah was so angry now. Spencer, too. Austin couldn't figure out if they were mad about the divorce, the move, or both. Probably the latter. At least Sydney was still her sweet self. When Austin crawled between his own sheets, he automatically gravitated to the left side, leaving the right empty. He grunted when he realized what he was doing and scooted to the middle of the king-sized mattress. Now he could take up as much space as he wanted without listening to Victoria complain. But as Austin drifted off to sleep, he wasn't thinking about Victoria and their many fights over her desire for freedom and his desire for stability. He wasn't worrying about work and the challenging situation he'd face when meeting with the animal rights group. He was thinking about the copper-haired teacher with the wide eyes and enticing lips. Chapter 3 A cold nose nudged Michelle's arm and a whine invaded her dreams. Not now, Bella, Michelle whispered. The handsome man held her in his arms, the mistletoe weaving a magic spell over them. His hands threaded through her hair, pulling strands loose from her side bun. A rough tongue ran up the side of her cheek. Bella, Michelle shrieked, but the dog just licked her again. Michelle laughed, giving her a hug. You rascal. Bella stared straight ahead with unseeing eyes. Michelle had stolen her from a cosmetic company where she worked as an intern in college. Bella had been barely more than a puppy and already blind from the tests. Michelle had always loved animals, but hadn't realized animal testing was still practiced in the United States until then. The night she stole Bella, she also joined their only voice. The dog let out a happy bark, then settled down, resting her head on Michelle's stomach. I kissed a guy last night, Michelle whispered, scratching behind the animal's ears. A total stranger. Bella yawned. Yeah, I can't believe it either. There was a reason Michelle rarely drank alcohol. At least she had had the good sense to run away and not give him her number. But that kiss? She'd felt it from the top of her head to the tips of her toes, a delicious shiver of belonging she hadn't experienced in years, if ever. Maybe she should have given him her number. Hudson certainly had thought her crazy for running away. Bella whined, prodding Michelle with her nose. The poor girl hadn't been outside in hours. Michelle rolled out of her bed, stretching until her back cracked. Then she followed Bella downstairs. Sometimes neighbor kids kicked balls into her yard and didn't latch the gate on their way out, so she made sure it was shut, then let Bella outside to take care of business. Hudson had miraculously won the flat screen, so Michelle spent the rest of the weekend grading papers at his house while they enjoyed the spoils of their labors. On Monday morning, Michelle set about getting the new student's desk and supplies ready. A few minutes before the first bell rang, the principal walked in with a little girl and an incredibly tall man. Michelle blinked, did a double take. No way. The man was Austin. His eyes widened, the chocolate caramel sparkles showing the same surprise she knew was reflected on her own face. Good morning, Miss Collins. Principal Rhodes said. She placed two hands on the young girl's shoulders, bracelets jangling on her thin arms at the movement. This is Sydney, your new student. Creamy white skin and a petite stature made Sydney look like a porcelain doll. No surprise given the stunning beauty her father possessed. Dark chestnut hair sun-kissed with bronzed was styled into two braided pigtails hanging over each shoulder. She was impeccably dressed in a plaid skirt and red top with a sparkly silver Christmas ornament applique. Large blue eyes framed by dark lashes stared up at Michelle with anxiety. First days were always so hard. Welcome, Sydney. Michelle kept her voice cheerful and soothing, not wanting to add to the girl's nerves. I'm so excited to have you in my class. Sydney took a step toward her father. I love your shirt, 
Michelle said. Christmas is my favorite holiday. Do you like Christmas? Sydney gave a shy smile, revealing two missing front teeth, and nodded. Good, Michelle said. I've got an ornament really similar to the one on your shirt on your homework folder this month. Want me to show you? Okay, Sydney said quietly. I'll leave you in Miss Collins' capable hands, Principal Rhodes said. Mr. O'Neill, please contact me with any questions or concerns you may have. Thank you, Austin said. Principal Rhodes nodded and left, the jangling of her bracelets echoing in the quiet room even after she'd left. Michelle showed Sydney her desk and homework folders, all too aware of Austin. The intense heat of his gaze burned through her as she explained class procedures to Sydney. The bell rang and students trickled into the classroom. Michelle snagged Chloe, one of the friendliest students in the class, and introduced the two girls. Was Austin going to stand there and stare at her all day? Miss Collins, may I speak with you in private for a moment? Austin asked. She did not want to have this conversation. Michelle glanced at Sydney. Chloe was telling her about the fun games they played at recess, and she seemed okay. Of course, Michelle said. Let's step into the hallway. Austin nodded and followed her out of the classroom. He paused in front of a wall covered in elves the kids had painted and folded his arms, eyes sparkling. I thought for sure I'd seen the last of you. It's a pretty big coincidence. Michelle's cheeks burned with a blush. Listen, about Friday. I swear I'm usually not that type of girl. I was having a rough night. And I'm not usually that type of guy. Now you're my daughter's teacher. I take that professional relationship very seriously, both with my students and their parents. I understand completely. Sydney is what's important here. So let's both agree to not speak of it again. Let's start over. Hi. Michelle held out her hand, relief sweeping through her. This hadn't turned out so badly after all. I'm Miss Collins, and I'll be your daughter's teacher this year. That half-grin flitted across Austin's face, and she wanted to melt against him. Austin O'Neill, and that's actually what I need to talk to you about. Sydney. Michelle immediately shifted into teacher mode. Okay, what can I help her with? It's been a rough year. Austin ran a hand through his hair. About nine months ago, their mother decided she'd rather start a new life with her personal trainer than stick it out with us. We're divorced now, but it's been a messy battle. I'm so sorry. And she'd practically thrown herself at him on Friday. She was swearing off champagne for good. It's probably for the best. Victoria was never a great mom. She hasn't had much to do with the kids since the divorce, and when I told her I was moving to L.A., all she requested was that I let her visit occasionally. She didn't want them to stay in Vegas with her. Michelle brought a hand to her chest. No wonder Sydney had looked so small and nervous. That's so hard, on you and the children. Obviously, I'm thrilled she didn't fight me for custody. It would have killed me to only see them half the time but my heart breaks for them. I can't imagine knowing your mother doesn't want much to do with you. I keep making excuses for Victoria, but I know the older two are at least suspicious. You have three kids? Yes. Spencer is in fifth grade, Mrs. Benson's class. Mariah is in seventh, so she's at the junior high. Thanks for letting me know about the situation, Michelle said. I'll keep a close eye on Sydney and let you know if I see any worrisome behaviors. I'd really appreciate it. The warning bell rang. Michelle had to wrap up this conversation quickly. If their mother calls or shows up, how would you like me to handle the situation? I won't let them leave with her if that's something your divorce agreement prohibits. I doubt Victoria will bother, but if she calls, you can speak freely with her about Sydney's progress. I can't prevent her from checking the kids out from school and spending time with them, but if she does show up in person, a minuscule possibility, I'd really appreciate a phone call so that I can handle the situation. Of course. 
Austin's eyes held onto hers and Michelle's breath escaped in a silent whoosh. Fire crackled between them. Michelle leaned toward him, the movement as unconscious as it was inevitable. Austin took a step back and blinked. Well, I better get to work. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help Sydney at home, either with the transition or her academics. I will. Austin gave a small nod, then stuck his hands in his pockets and strolled down the hallway. He turned around, a smirk on his face, and Michelle felt her cheeks flame red. He'd caught her watching him walk away. That relationship was out of the question. She'd had her fling, and now she would stay eternally single. Besides, he was the dad of one of her students. She wouldn't risk the mess that might occur if they attempted a relationship and it ended up turning sour, as all of hers inevitably did. Her last boyfriend had been an older man as well, also a divorcee, although without kids, and he'd bolted the second she wanted to get serious. And he'd hated that she was vegan. Michelle watched Sydney closely throughout the morning, but she seemed to be adjusting just fine. Michelle was pleased to see Chloe and Sydney sitting together in the cafeteria before she headed to the teacher's lounge for her own lunch. She grabbed her bean sprout salad from the fridge, decorated like a snowman, and sat down in her usual spot near one of the other second-grade teachers. Hey, Michelle, Dave said. How was your weekend? Not bad, Michelle said. What about yours? It was one basketball game right after another. We spent Saturday morning running the four kids all over the city. But I did manage to take Kelly out that night. We saw Wicked. I've been dying to see it. Michelle had wanted to buy tickets, but would have felt silly going by herself. It was totally worth the money, Dave said. We really enjoyed it. The cast put on a phenomenal production. I think I'll take her to The Lion King for her birthday. I saw that one last year. Definitely worth the money. Good to know. Did you see the school has officially canceled the San Diego field trip? Yes, Michelle said, regret making her tone bitter. Can't say I'm surprised. It was like pulling teeth to get them to fund it last year. I'm not looking forward to the students' reactions when the principal makes the announcement this afternoon. They chatted for a few more minutes, then both pulled out reading material. Dave a novel, and Michelle the local newspaper. It was one of the reasons they got along so well together. They both understood the other's need for silence. Michelle flipped through the first half of the newspaper, only stopping here and there to read an article. The high school was doing a coat drive and having a lot of success. The mayor asked people to consider donating money to soup kitchens and shelters instead of handing it over to panhandlers. And Austin O'Neill, the new marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical had been seen kissing an unknown woman at a holiday party over the weekend. Michelle stared at the picture, heat flaming through her entire body. No way. Her face was hidden by the man's head, but the dress was unmistakably hers, and Austin's profile left no doubt that it was him. Austin worked for Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, and now she was publicly linked to him. Ruth, not to mention Autumn and the rest of their only voice, would flip. Michelle quickly read through the article, anger boiling inside her. Suddenly their kiss felt dirty and cheap. She had spent the last year working tirelessly to bring Wellsprings Pharmaceutical to their knees. They were directly responsible for the suffering of thousands of animals, helpless, sweet animals like Bella and she'd kiss the man who was trying to put a positive PR spin on animal testing. Had he known a photographer was there? Had he kissed her because of it? There was no way he could know who she was. You okay? Dave asked, eyeing her from across the table. Yes. Michelle quickly shut the paper and shoved it in her bag. I've got a few things to do before lunch is over. See you tomorrow. Dave nodded, and Michelle quickly left the room. Back in her classroom, she ripped the paper open and frantically turned pages until she found the article again. It's just a local paper, she reminded herself. 
a circulation of 30,000, tops. At least half of those threw the paper away unopened, and the other half never made it to the end. The article was on the second-to-last page, and the picture was grainy and unclear. No one, except maybe Hudson, would guess it was Michelle in that photo. Except she'd worn that dress to the party their only voice had crashed last month. Autumn might recognize it. Heat coiled in her limbs, making them ache. Their only voice would see this as a betrayal of their trust. The marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. What were the odds? Almost made her miss the wild game hunter she had fallen for once upon a time. Michelle tried to push Austin out of her mind for the rest of the day, but it was difficult when Sydney was a constant reminder. Should Michelle mention the article to him? Tell him she was an active member of their only voice? The final bell rang and students raced from the classroom. Austin waited in the hallway. Sydney skipped toward him, wrapping her arms around him in a hug. Hey, pumpkin. He crouched down and kissed her on the cheek. How was your first day at your new school? I made a friend. Sydney's voice was barely louder than a whisper, but the dimple in one cheek said she'd had a good day. Some of Michelle's anger melted away. How could such a wonderful dad work for such an evil company? Excellent. Austin said. Why don't you go find Spencer at the front of the school where I showed you this morning? I'll be there in just a moment. Okay. Sydney gave a small wave. See you tomorrow, Miss Collins. Bye, Sydney, Michelle said. As soon as the girl disappeared around the corner, Austin turned to face Michelle. How did she do today? Great. She and Chloe seemed to have become instant friends. They sat together at lunch and played with each other during recess. Academically, I have no concerns so far. Sydney is a very bright girl. Austin smiled, the pride evident on his face. You'll hear no arguments from me. The adorable daddy persona wouldn't sway her. He was for animal testing. She couldn't forget that. So, you're the new marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. It wasn't a question. Austin rubbed his jaw. You read the local paper, huh? Yes. I'm really sorry about that. I guess my appointment is a hot topic since Wellsprings has been in the local press so much lately. I had no idea the photographer was there until after we... Well, until after. Michelle folded her arms. I'm a member of their only voice. His wide eyes and slack jaw convinced her he hadn't known that when they kissed. Oh. Things keep getting more and more interesting. I thought you should know. Have a good day, Mr. O'Neill. Michelle turned and walked back into her classroom, leaving him standing in the hallway, alone. Chapter 4 Michelle was a member of their only voice. Today kept getting weirder and weirder. At what point would the coincidences stop? Austin opened the back door of his gray Land Rover and Spencer and Sydney piled in. Mariah already sat in the passenger seat, texting away. Lucy, the college student he'd hired, would do school drop-off and pick up most days, but he wanted to do it himself today. How was your first day? he asked. In the safety of their own car, Sydney's entire face lit up. Austin's heart melted at the toothless grin. Great! I already made one friend. Her name is Chloe, and she's really nice. She shared a cookie with me at lunch, and I shared my brownie with her, and then we pretended to be horses at recess. That sounds like a lot of fun. Austin's grip on the steering wheel relaxed. He'd been so worried that this first day would be awful. Yeah, but everyone was kind of sad. Sophie said. We don't get to go to the zoo anymore because there's not enough money. I think Miss Collins almost cried. Hmm, Austin said. He seriously doubted that Michelle had gotten teary because of a canceled field trip. She'd been tough as nails moments ago, all traces of the soft woman who had melted in his arms gone. Funny. He could think of another woman with the ability to change on a dime. 
He glanced at Spencer in the rearview mirror, his heart sinking. Spencer's arms were folded, his brows pulled down in a scowl. How was your day, Spencer? Austin asked. Silence. Austin pulled out of the school parking lot. Spencer? He repeated. It was fine, okay, but I like my old school better. I hate being the new kid. A lump formed in Austin's throat. I know it's hard at first, bud. How would you know? Grandma and Grandpa never made you move. Austin swallowed. That was true. He had never been the new kid, and he had never had to watch his parents go through a bitter divorce. I didn't have to start at a new school today, but I did start a new job last week. That was scary too, but now I've made some friends and it isn't so scary anymore. I'm really sorry this is so hard, but it'll get better, I promise. Mariah snorted in the seat next to him. You can't promise that either. I'm trying my best here, Austin said. Spencer let out a gusty sigh. We should have stayed in Vegas with Mom. Mom's too busy with her new boyfriend to spend time with us, stupid, Mariah said. Mommy's taking us to Santa's village, Sydney said, her lip trembling. She still likes us. Your mother loves you very much. The words sounded weak, even to Austin. How did he end up here, defending the actions of a woman who'd transformed into someone he didn't even recognize? After five minutes of silence, Austin flipped on the radio just to hear noise. He took his usual shortcut through a residential neighborhood, passing by a family of inflatable snowmen waving happily from a drive strip. He hated what Victoria had done to their family. His mind flickered back to his conversation that morning with Michelle. She had been so completely opposite of Victoria. Down to earth, naturally good with children, compassionate. Everything had changed that afternoon. Her cold voice and folded arms said she despised him for working for Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. It was probably for the best. She looked ten years younger than him, for starters. She was a member of their only voice. And the trump card, she was Sydney's teacher. He should stop thinking about her. But that kiss? Well, it was hard to forget. Austin tried to get more out of the kids once they were home, but Mariah disappeared into her room to do homework, and Spencer became engrossed with some video game. Even Sydney was too busy playing on her tablet to talk. By the time the children were all in bed, Austin was exhausted in more ways than one. He wandered into the living room and sank onto the couch, grabbing the remote. All he wanted was to watch the news for a half hour, then collapse in bed. His phone rang, a shotgun in the silent living room. Austin picked up the cell and his heart dropped. Victoria. He took a deep breath, trying to remain calm, then flicked his phone on. Hello? When were you going to tell me you have a new girlfriend? Excuse me? I saw the newspaper article with the two of you. Or did you forget that I have a friend who lives in Yorba Linda? You can't seriously be trying to keep her a secret from me. I always know, Austin. Always. Anger flared inside him. He'd forgotten about the friend. What he did was no longer any of Victoria's business. Oh, you mean like how you kept Roberto a secret from me for an entire year? We're not talking about me. For someone who's always been so annoyed with my impulsive behavior, you've certainly moved on quickly. Austin let out a humorless laugh. You might have moved out nine months ago, but emotionally, you've been gone for years. You made me miserable. So you're going to punish your children because of our crappy relationship? I haven't once heard you ask how they're doing. They started at their new schools today, but it doesn't seem like you really care. Of course I care, Victoria said, and her voice was softer this time. How was their first day? If you had called an hour earlier, you could have asked them yourself. They're asleep now. Well, Sydney and Spencer were asleep. Mariah had been on her phone last he checked. I waited to call because I didn't want them to hear us fighting. They've heard enough of that. 
Hearing us fight probably doesn't upset them nearly as much as the fact that you can't even be bothered to call and talk to them occasionally. You're not going to turn this around on me. Who is she, Austin? That's none of your business. Victoria let out a growl. I shouldn't have to find out about your new girlfriend from a newspaper article. One of my friends tells me about. You might as well tell me who she is. The press will find out soon enough. It was one photo in the back of a local newspaper. The press couldn't care less who she is or if we're together. They wanted one splashy article, and that's going to be the end of it. Austin would make sure of it. First thing tomorrow, he called the paper and offered to give them an exclusive interview in exchange for no more unsanctioned articles. You can try and replace me, Austin, but I see right through you. He couldn't hold back a snort of laughter. How had he ever ended up with Victoria? He'd always been a bit of an outcast in high school, the acne-prone band geek with braces. When Victoria started paying attention to him, Austin had been dazzled by her beauty and ignored all the warning signs. Her thirst for adventure had intoxicated him. If you want to talk to the kids tomorrow, they go to bed at eight. He clicked off the phone amid her protests. How had the woman he loved transformed into the witch he had just spoken with on the phone? Was he that bad at judging character? He thought of the look Michelle had given him that afternoon. His phone buzzed. If Victoria was calling him back... But it wasn't Victoria. The phone lit up with a short four-word text from Mark. They're at it again. A link followed. Austin opened the link, his stress compounding. A blog post immediately loaded on the website of the local chapter of Their Only Voice. He carefully read the article, the knot in his stomach growing tighter with every word. The chapter president, Ruth, had written this one. She claimed an insider had given her an exclusive glimpse into the testing facility at Wellsprings Pharmaceutical and had spoken of the deplorable conditions the animals were kept in. Austin read the article again, keeping an eye out for any specifics that might hint at truth, but everything was spoken of in vague terms and there were no photos included. Austin dialed Mark. He answered immediately. Can you believe it? Do these people not have a life? Surely they have something better to do with their time than try and wreck us. Did Michelle spend her evenings helping Ruth craft these articles, or was she too busy grading papers? They're making some pretty serious claims, Austin said. Of course they are. That's what these groups do. Twenty bucks says the article is picked up by the local paper. Jeez. I've got to ask, Mark, is there any truth to their claims? Mark let out a snort. Absolutely not. Trust me, those animals are in the frickin' Ritz-Carlton of testing facilities. There wasn't one concrete claim made in that post. Yeah, I know. But I had to ask. The local paper might pick the blog post up, but I doubt it'll hurt us much. Worst case scenario, it starts getting shared around social media and comments poke holes in their claims. I spoke with their only voice earlier today, and they've agreed to let me speak to them at their weekly meeting. Maybe a face-to-face -face will help. I hope so, Mark said. Thanks, Austin. They said their goodbyes and Austin hung up the phone. Meeting with the group was risky, but he thought it was the best course of action right now. And maybe, if luck was on his side, Michelle would be there. Chapter 5 Maybe no one from their only voice had seen the photo. Michelle opened the glass door and nodded to the librarian behind the tinsel-lined circulation desk. Or maybe they had seen the photo, but not guessed it was her. Yeah, and maybe the group had ordered a giant platter of bacon as the refreshment for the meeting, too. Ruth knew when someone so much as tweeted about Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. No way she'd missed an entire article. Hudson was never going to believe this. Michelle had been dying to text him but hadn't had time. She pulled open the door to the meeting room. Ruth, the president, was already at the front, writing the meeting's agenda on the whiteboard. She batted away a piece of garland that hung from the top, letting out an annoyed grunt. 
Great. Seemed like Ruth was even crankier than normal. Good afternoon, Michelle, Ruth said, her voice frostier than the decoratively painted library windows. She gave a closed-lipped smile that had Michelle clutching her purse strap tighter. Why was Autumn never on time? Michelle was only five minutes early, but most of the activists in the group didn't pay attention to things like schedules. Take a seat, Ruth said. The others should be here shortly. Maybe Ruth had a bad day at the animal shelter she ran. She wasn't exactly a cheery individual, which probably went a long way in explaining why the organization's relationship with Wellsprings Pharmaceutical had deteriorated so rapidly over the last year. The previous marketing director certainly hadn't helped matters with his surly personality and lack of a verbal filter. Michelle chose a chair near the middle of the room, facing the whiteboard. She set her purse on the floor and pulled out her phone, desperate to look busy. Might as well fill Hudson in on the newest developments with Austin. You're never going to guess who my mystery guy is. The response was almost immediate. Who? Austin O'Neill, the new marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Are you serious? Hudson demanded. Yes, and some reporter got a picture of us kissing. At their only voice now, fingers crossed no one recognized me. Call me later, Hudson texted back. Good luck. The door opened, startling Michelle. She let out a sigh of relief as Doug entered, a beanie pulled low over his dreads. Autumn was close behind, looking beautiful in a lace skirt and ballet flats. Hey, Autumn said, leaning down and giving Michelle a hug. How was the party? Fine, Michelle said. Was it her imagination, or had Ruth's posture stiffened at the question? We missed you at drinks, Doug said. We're planning a killer wilderness retreat this summer. You should totally come. Oh, you have to, Autumn said. Doug knows this guy who can help us build our own canoes out of reclaimed wood. Sounds fun, Michelle said. Ruth capped the marker and took a seat, facing the rest of the room. Michelle scanned the agenda on the whiteboard, anything to avoid Ruth's death glare. Looked like Ruth wanted them to pass out flyers advertising the animal shelter again. Christmas was usually a great time to place abandoned animals with loving families. A few shifts still needed to be filled for manning the table sponsoring the animal testing bill, and the marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical wanted to talk to them. Today. Michelle placed a hand on her chest, splaying her fingers wide. The marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Austin would be here any minute. Are you okay? Autumn asked, playing with the rainbow-colored braid hanging over one shoulder. Yeah, Michelle said. Would Austin let it slip that they had met before? Eight more members of their only voice trickled into the meeting room. Ruth stood and called the room to order. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight, Ruth said. The marketing director of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, Austin O'Neill, will be here in just a few minutes to speak to us. Boo! Doug threw a pen at the whiteboard. The hairs on the back of Michelle's neck stood on end. Your feelings on the subject are noted, Ruth said. But this is the first time Wellsprings has reached out to us, and I felt allowing Mr. O'Neill to speak tonight could only further our cause. That's not what I wish to discuss right now, however. Ruth pulled a newspaper out of her backpack and snapped it open. Michelle, care to explain? Michelle closed her eyes, humiliation washing over her. Wow, Autumn said. Is that you? I can't believe you didn't tell me. Who's the hunk? That would be none other than Austin O'Neill, Ruth said. This is you, Michelle, isn't it? I recognize the dress. A low murmur filled the room and Michelle sank lower in her chair. I didn't know it was him at the time. You kiss the enemy? Autumn said, shock and disbelief making her voice rise an octave. Not cool, Michelle, Doug said, and someone else murmured their agreement. It wasn't like that, Michelle said. I was a little tipsy and not thinking clearly. I had no idea that Austin had a connection to Wellsprings at the time. That kiss is the one and only between us. 
I can't believe this, Autumn said. She folded her arms, eyes clouded with hurt. I didn't know, Michelle said. I swear, Autumn, I had no idea. So, you haven't seen him since? Ruth asked. Well, Michelle said. Angry faces glared at her from all sides of the room. You have, Autumn pointed an accusing finger. Don't lie to us. I'm his daughter's teacher, Michelle said. She was the new student. It's not like I can avoid the man, but I can assure you that my professional relationship with Mr. O'Neill in no way changes my dedication to their only voice. I am as committed to our goals as ever. Including taking down Wellsprings Pharmaceutical and calling for the end of animal testing? Ruth asked. Including that, Michelle agreed. Promise. The door creaked open and Austin peeked in, effectively bringing the conversation to a halt. He walked to the front of the room and extended a hand toward Ruth. Hi, you must be Ruth. It's so nice to finally meet you. I'll reserve my own opinion on the matter until we hear what you have to say. Ruth gave his hand a brusque shake. Please, take a seat. Thank you. Austin sank into the chair next to Michelle, giving her a sly grin. Miss Collins? Mr. O'Neill, she said. Autumn leaned over and whispered in Doug's ear. Michelle heard a tisk from the back of the room and sank lower in her chair, wishing she could disappear. Four years of dedication and loyalty to their only voice, and this was the thanks she got? Don't be mad, Michelle whispered to Autumn. I'm trying not to be, Autumn said. But Austin O'Neill? Really? I give you the floor, Ruth said, motioning to Austin. Thank you. He adjusted his tie, and that small sign of nerves had Michelle fighting a smile. Until she caught Ruth's glare. I'm excited to be here and meet with all of you fine people, Austin continued. I know tension has been high between their only voice and Wellsprings Pharmaceutical the past year, but I can assure you that we have every intention of working hard to improve our relationship and work together to help the community. I guess animals aren't part of our community then, Doug said. I can assure you that Wellsprings Pharmaceutical has the deepest respect for all life, including animal. You mean like when your former marketing director almost ran over a dog on purpose? Autumn demanded. I unfortunately can't comment on that incident, Austin said. The room erupted in a roar and Michelle winced. He couldn't have picked a worse thing to say. Wellsprings Pharmaceutical had refused to comment on many incidents over the past year. Please, Austin held up a hand. I know you feel like you haven't been heard in the past, but I intend to change all that. And how exactly are you planning on doing that? Ruth said. We value actions, not words. We've been burned too many times in the past. How do you explain your company's backing of the current bill being voted on in the House, which gives companies like yours a tax break for continuing animal testing? The fact of the matter is animal testing saves lives. The room exploded again and anger stirred in Michelle's chest. How could anyone with even half a heart say something like that? Try telling that to the animals, she said. My dog is blind from one of your tests. You didn't allow me to finish, Austin said, and Doug let out a growl. Animal testing saves lives. That's a scientific fact. However, what that bill does is improve the conditions of animals living in labs across the entire state, and that's something I think we can all agree is in the best interest of everyone. Their only voices continued support of the opposing bill said otherwise. There are alternative means of testing, Ruth said. We've discussed those options with your company's vice president, but he's unwilling to listen to reason. Creating a lot of drama in the press isn't serving either of our end goals, Austin said. Oh, I disagree, Michelle said. The more aware the public is, the less they will support crooked companies like yours. Knowledge is power, and we're not about to let you keep the truth from the community. We want to work together, Austin began, but Michelle tuned him out. She was done listening. 
He's not looking so great now, is he? Autumn whispered. Michelle couldn't believe she'd ever kissed him. So what if he was a loving father? He represented everything she detested. She would fight against Austin, if that's what it took to protect animals like Bella. And she would win. Chapter 6 The meeting with their only voice couldn't have gone worse. Clearly, the group was beyond reason. Austin loosened his tie as he drove, glaring at the trio of cheerful inflatable snowmen. He definitely felt a sympathy for the former marketing director that he hadn't before. Ruth was an expert at twisting his meaning and inciting wrath. The media looked like cuddly kittens compared to the pit bull she'd proved to be. And Michelle had sat there, sending painfully sharp glares his way the entire meeting. The amazing chemistry he had felt underneath the mistletoe might as well be a dream. The pleasant buzz of that moment was most definitely gone. Well, Michelle could glare all she wanted. For better or worse, he was a Wellsprings pharmaceutical employee. Did he 100% agree with everything the company stood for? No. But he had a family to support, and he refused to feel guilty for that. Things will look better tomorrow he promised himself as he drifted off to sleep that night. But when he arrived at the office the next morning, Ruth was standing on the sidewalk with five other people, most of whom he recognized from last night. Animal lives matter! She chanted into a bullhorn while they waved picket signs. Fantastic. At least Michelle wasn't among the protesters. The chant grated on his nerves for the next two days. When the phone rang two hours after he arrived at the office on Friday, he picked it up with a growl. Austin speaking. Mr. O'Neill? The voice was soft and feminine, but not timid. Michelle was anything but that. Reserved, maybe, but not shy. Hi, he said, instantly changing the tone of his voice. No point in making a difficult situation even worse. What can I do for you today? I'm calling to see if we can arrange a time for parent-teacher conferences. You never sent the slip confirming a time back to school with Sydney. Austin made a face. Now Michelle not only thought him evil, but irresponsible. I'm so sorry, I completely forgot. The housekeeper makes a paperwork pile for me, but I haven't gotten to it in a few days. Would this evening work for you? Michelle asked. Today? Sydney had only been in school a week. How much could there be to talk about? Yes, I have an opening at seven o'clock tonight. That should give you sufficient time to get off work and to the school without needing to leave early. I'll be there. See you then. The phone clicked. Austin set the phone back on his desk. It was so hard to read tone through a phone line. At least Sydney seemed to love Miss Collins. She came home every day chattering about the hands-on lessons and how nice her teacher was. After meeting with their only voice, Austin had worried Michelle would take her dislike of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, and by extension him, out on an innocent seven-year-old. That hadn't happened, and his respect for her had grudgingly grown. He hated himself for wishing Michelle liked him as much as she liked Sydney. Why couldn't he get that kiss out of his head? Michelle made him feel more alive than he had in years. She challenged him, was surprisingly funny, and treated her students with a love and compassion that was rare. Mr. O'Neill, are you ready for the meeting? His secretary asked, peeking her head into his office. Austin forced Michelle out of his head and unplugged his laptop. Yes, I'm headed there now. The first half of the meeting was painfully dull. Austin updated the group on the situation with their only voice before the discussion turned to other topics. He zoned out. How would Michelle behave at their meeting tonight? She was a puzzle, one he was dying to figure out. If we don't spend this money on a tax-deductible charitable contribution before the end of the year, our accountants say we'll end up paying it to the government, Mark said. He leaned back in his chair, one leg crossed and a flip-flop dangling from his foot. Austin straightened, focusing on the conversation. A budget surplus? 
This might be just the answer to their PR problem. Let's put our heads together and come up with something awesome we can spend this money on, Mark said. And let's make it something that'll remind the community we aren't evil. Uncle Sam isn't getting so much as a dime we don't have to give them. Too bad spending the money on the test animals wouldn't qualify as a charitable contribution. Still, there had to be a way to make this work in their favor. I have an idea, Austin said, his mind whirling with the possibility. Let's hear it, Mark said. All second graders at the elementary school my two youngest attend usually take a field trip to the San Diego Zoo in February. Due to budget cuts, they've canceled the trip. The kids are incredibly disappointed. My daughter's talked about it all week. A zoo trip? Mark rubbed his chin. That's kind of cool. Spending the money on something like that would show the community we're a company that cares about animals and conservation efforts. Yeah, Mark said. But donating the money to the zoo would do the same thing with a lot less effort. The logistics of the field trip could be time-consuming. I'm sure the school would make all the arrangements if we foot the bill, Austin said. I'm all about simplicity right now, Mark said. Donating to the zoo still seems like the easier route. My daughter's teacher is a member of their only voice, Austin threw out. If he could make this happen, no way Michelle would still be able to hate him. He wanted, no needed her not to hate him, for reasons he wasn't yet ready to examine. Mark paused. Are you sure? Yes. She was there when I met with the group this week. She's been an active member for the past few years, and she's very upset with Wellsprings Pharmaceutical right now. And with Austin. Huh. So this would kind of be like a direct gift to their only voice. Mark looked around the room. Well, what does everyone else think? I'll have to run some calculations, but I don't think a zoo trip for a hundred second graders will come close to spending the amount of money we need to unload before the end of the year, the accountant said. We could set up a fund to pay for the next few years of field trips, Austin suggested. The accountant shook his head. There's not enough time before the end of the year to make everything nice and legal, and it would just cost money we could give directly to the kids. Then take the entire school. Austin said. Think what a great headline that will make in the local papers. I like it. Mark pointed to the accountant. Get some numbers drawn up by the end of the day. We want to spend as much of that money as we can without going over. Got it, boss, the accountant said. Austin, I'll let you handle things with the school, Mark continued. You've already got contacts there and can put a positive spin on it for the community. I'll be there tonight for a parent-teacher conference, Austin said. If legal can write up a proposal today, I'll take it with me to the school. Make it happen, people, Mark said. Now get back to work. Austin grabbed his laptop, unable to hide the grin. He'd just secured a trip for Michelle's entire school to a world-famous zoo where the students would learn about endangered animals and conservation efforts. No way she'd still think he was the bad guy after this. Mark, Austin said, catching him just outside the door. I've spent the last few days thinking about how to get the protesters to stop. Let's arrange a tour of the animal testing lab for their only voice with a camera crew present. The group's claims will lose all credibility if the public sees on the five o'clock news that we're doing nothing wrong. Mark pursed his lips, shoving his hands in the pockets of his cargo shorts. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I respectfully disagree. That blog post is still getting shared on social media, and transparency is our best option. Groups like that will twist our words in their favor, and I'm not willing to take that risk. But I like that you're thinking outside the box. We'll hit on a solution soon. He clapped Austin on the back and walked away. Austin watched Mark disappear into his office, stunned. He understood Mark's hesitance, but not even considering the idea smacked of having something to hide. By the time Austin left for the parent-teacher conference, he had a proposal for the principal in his hands. 
He arrived at the school early enough to run it by Principal Rhodes, and she enthusiastically agreed. He couldn't wait to tell Michelle. Hi, Michelle said, looking up from her desk and giving him a tight-lipped smile, one he was starting to recognize as a poor attempt to hide displeasure. Thank you for coming tonight. Of course. He took the chair she indicated. Again, I'm so sorry I didn't make the appointment myself. There was that tight-lipped smile again. I'm sure you're very busy. She slid a progress report across the desk toward him. Only two assignments were listed, but Sydney had received top marks on both. Now, I know Sydney's only been here a week, but she's doing remarkably well. We haven't had many homework assignments, but she's turned them all in completed and on time. It's obvious she's a very bright student. She's made a few friends and overall seems to be acclimating well. I think she's doing as good as can be expected, given the difficult circumstances surrounding the move, better than expected even. Now, we have a holiday program a week from Tuesday for just the second graders at 10 o'clock. Parents are encouraged to attend and support their students. This is an opportunity for the kids to demonstrate what they've learned so far this year, and they really have been practicing hard and are looking forward to it. Sydney is picking up the songs incredibly fast, and I know she'll do fine at the program, but you could help her memorize the words to some of the more unfamiliar songs at home. She slid a music score across the table and continued to talk about upcoming projects and what would be expected from the students after the holiday break. Austin listened attentively, but it took everything in him not to jump in and tell her the good news about the school. I guess that's just about it, Michelle said. Do you have any questions or concerns? No, but there is something I wanted to discuss with you. Michelle placed her hands on the desk, looking him directly in the eye for the first time all evening. I'm listening. Wellsprings Pharma, she stood, pushing back her chair. I think I've heard enough. Austin stood as well. I don't think you have. I know you're disappointed that the school can't fund the San Diego Zoo trip this year due to budget cuts. Sydney's been talking about it all week. I don't see what this has to do with that atrocious company you work for. We want to pay for the entire school to go. I've already spoken with Principal Rhodes and she's beyond excited. I'll make the announcement at the Christmas assembly and present a golden ticket so the reporters covering the event have something to photograph. And I want you to be the one to accept it. Chapter 7 Michelle leaned forward, placing her hands on her desk as she struggled to stay upright. You have got to be kidding me. I assure you I'm 100% serious. She folded her arms, chest heaving as she fought back the words she wanted to let fly. If you think Wellsprings Pharmaceutical can convince the community they're the good guys through buying off their children, you're wrong. Wellsprings Pharmaceutical is the good guy, Austin said. Yes, we do animal testing but we're developing medications that help and could save potentially millions. The anti-seizure medication we're testing right now is life-changing. I'm not against the medications you're developing. I'm against your methods. You act like I'm a scientist down in the lab. I have to feed my kids somehow. There are other jobs. Yes, but this one helps people. Michelle ran a hand through her hair, agitation making her entire body tremble. Oh, I see. And animals aren't people. Austin raised an eyebrow and her cheeks heated with a blush. You know what I mean, she bit out. I want you to accept the ticket. You're Sydney's teacher, so it makes sense. Get Spencer's teacher to accept it. I'm sure Mrs. Benson will be more than happy to oblige. Mrs. Benson doesn't teach second grade. You do, and that's where the funding was cut. Austin's voice was so calm and rational she could scream. Think how great it'll feel to accept that on the kid's behalf. You'll be a hero. Heroes stand up for what they believe in. You only want me to accept the ticket because I'm a member of their only voice and that'll send a message to the media. I'm the marketing director. Of course I want that but I want to help the kids too. Please, Michelle. 
You are insufferable. How had she ever melted at the sight of him? Her hands shook as she pointed at the door. Good night, Mr. O'Neill. Michelle, good night. Austin stared at her for a moment, then let out a sigh and left the room. Michelle waited three minutes, then marched down the hallway. She barely waited for Principal Rhodes to say enter before marching into her office. Did you tell Austin that I'd accept an oversized golden ticket at the Christmas assembly? Principal Rhodes leaned back in her chair, giving Michelle her full attention. Yes. Michelle collapsed into a chair. This has to be some kind of sick joke. You know how much I hate Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Are you seriously accepting money from them? Are you seriously suggesting that I deprive our entire school of an educational and much-anticipated field trip just because you don't like the company that's willing to donate the money? Well, when she put it that way... No, Michelle said, but her voice sounded sulky even to her own ears. Austin specifically requested that you be the one to accept the ticket, Principal Rhodes continued. And I'm not about to risk Wellsprings pulling the offer because we ask for a change to the assembly. So you will be the one to accept that ticket, and you will do so graciously with a smile on your face. He's inviting the media. Of course he is. Companies like these don't donate money without trying to get something out of it. As long as my students get to go to the San Diego Zoo next spring, that's perfectly fine with me. Any questions? No, Michelle said, trying not to sulk. Okay, then. Have a good weekend. Like she could have a good weekend now. Their only voice was going to flip. She pulled out her phone and quickly texted Hudson. You'll never believe what just happened. Michelle was still fuming when she got home. She let Bella out into the small backyard, then started making a salad. Okay. So the kids were going to be thrilled that the field trip was officially back on, and Michelle loved that her students would get to make that memory. But one good deed didn't erase all the bad ones. If they were truly interested in helping animals, they'd stop doing harmful tests on them. The screech of brakes filled the kitchen, followed by a sickening thud and a howl. Bella. The paring knife clattered to the tile floor and Michelle sprinted toward the front door. She knocked a nativity off a small end table and it crashed to the ground, shattering. Michelle didn't care. Bella lay in the middle of the blacktop, the white fur of her belly streaked with red. Taillights disappeared around the corner. No! Michelle yelled, flinging herself at Bella. A leg twitched as the dog struggled to breathe. Her blood-streaked belly had already swollen. Brakes screeched again, and Michelle threw herself over Bella. But it was just a gray Land Rover stopping to help. The door flew open, and a man raced toward her. What was Austin doing here? Michelle didn't even care. She needed help. It was some punk kid on a cell phone, Austin said. He got scared and gunned it. I'm calling the police. No! Michelle grabbed his hand. There's nothing they can do now. Please, just help me get her to the vet. Austin nodded, shoving his phone back in his pocket. Michelle reached down, tears coating her cheeks as she picked up Bella and the dog whimpered in protest. I let her into the backyard. Michelle fought to keep back the hysteria. I forgot to check that the gates were locked. It's okay, Austin said. You hold her and I'll drive. She's bleeding. Michelle wiped away the trickle of blood across Bella's cheek with a corner of her skirt. She's going to be okay. Austin helped Michelle into his car before racing to the other side. Which way to the vet? Michelle pointed, mumbling instructions. Bella's breathing was shallow and she let out another howl. She ran right off the sidewalk and into the car's path, Austin said. She's blind, Michelle said, because of a makeup some cosmetic company tested on her. Oh. Michelle tightened her grip on Bella, then loosened it when the dog whimpered. What were you doing in my neighborhood? I was on my way home. It's quicker to drive through your neighborhood at this time of day. 
I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't come along. Right now, it didn't matter that Austin worked for an evil corporation. All that mattered was his willingness to help Bella. The dog let out a pained whine, and Austin pressed harder on the gas pedal. Her stomach's swollen, Michelle said. I think she's bleeding internally. We're almost there. Michelle was out of the car almost before Austin put it in park. She raced into the office, Austin right behind her. Please, my dog, she said. Somebody hit her. The receptionist quickly ushered them into a room. Within moments, the vet was examining Bella. But Michelle already knew what he was going to tell her. Bella's fur was cooler than it should have been, and her breathing had slowed down significantly. I'm pretty sure she has internal bleeding, the vet said. I'm going to do some scans so we can get a better picture of what's going on. Michelle nodded. Austin's arm came around her shoulder and she leaned into him, relishing the support. Did a cosmetic company really make Bella blind? Austin whispered. Michelle nodded, more tears breaking free. I worked in the mailroom as an intern during college. When I found out what had happened to Bella, I quit my job and sneaked her out of the building. You stole your dog? But his tone wasn't accusatory. It was admiring. They were hurting her, and the company never came looking. What's one less animal to them? She was scheduled to be put to sleep. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. His hand gently brushed a tear from her cheek, and she leaned into him. This is why I have to fight Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, she whispered. Bella whimpered from where she lay underneath a CT machine. Austin's arm tightened around Michelle's shoulder, and she wanted nothing more than to collapse against him. But she needed to be strong for Bella. She was so glad Austin was here. After twenty agonizing minutes, the vet came back into the room. Bella's bleeding internally, he said. Her spleen ruptured on impact, and a lot of her other organs are damaged as well. We can try surgery, but if she makes it through alive, her quality of life will be severely decreased. The kindest thing to do might be to let Bella go. Michelle's knees buckled, but Austin's strong arm kept her from falling. Absolutely not. If there's a chance Bella could pull through, I'm going to take it. Michelle, Austin said gently. Surgery isn't cheap and Bella's suffered enough. She whirled, wanting to pound on Austin's chest and scream. Yes, she has suffered enough because of companies like yours. She turned to the vet. We're doing the surgery. I strongly discourage it, the vet said. You should take this chance to say goodbye. Bella's at least ten years old. She's unlikely to pull through the surgery. Michelle walked over to the table and gathered Bella into her arms, clinging to her with a desperation she wasn't sure she could physically contain. The dog gave a whimper, then rested her head on Michelle's arm with a relieved sigh. A hand brushed Michelle's shoulder. How long has Bella been under the care of this vet? Austin asked. Nine years, Michelle choked out, since I brought her to live with me. And do you trust him? Michelle nodded, pushing tears down her cheek with each rapid blink. I can tell you love Bella very much. You don't want to cause her more pain than she's already suffered. It's time to let her go. Michelle's heart shattered, both with the pain and truth of his words. She looked down at Bella, who stared up at her with those vacant eyes. Her tongue lolled out to the side of her mouth, and her entire body shuddered with each breath. Can you give us a minute? Michelle asked the vet. Of course. The vet bowed his head and quietly exited the room. I can wait outside, Austin said. She glanced up at him, barely able to make out his figure through the blur of tears. Please stay, she said, her voice choked. Okay. Michelle buried her face in Bella's fur, letting her tears soak the animal. We've had some good times together, girl, she whispered. But it's time for you to go on to the next adventure without me. 
I will never forget you, and I'll never stop fighting to prevent other animals from suffering like you. Bella let out a whine, her body relaxing in Michelle's arms. I love you, Michelle whispered. Bella grunted, then she closed her eyes and stopped moving. Michelle let out a sob. Austin left the room and returned moments later with the vet. He gently placed the stethoscope on Bella's chest, repositioning it three times before finally draping it around his neck. She's gone, he said. I'm so sorry for your loss. Take as much time as you need. Michelle collapsed, throwing her body over Bella's as she sobbed. Hadn't Bella suffered enough? She didn't deserve to die this way. A hand rested on her back and Michelle turned, throwing herself into Austin's arms. I don't know what I'm going to do without her. I know. Austin gently rubbed her back. But you don't have to go through it alone. I'm here for you, whatever you need. We're here for you, the slogan of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Michelle pushed Austin away. It's because of you Bella's dead. Austin took a step back, his eyes bewildered. I don't. A company just like Wellsprings Pharmaceutical is the reason Bella couldn't see that car. You might as well have run over her yourself. Michelle, I... You confused me with your stupid words and compelling eyes or whatever. If I hadn't wasted precious minutes listening to you, Bella might have made it to surgery in time. I didn't even try to save her. What kind of mother am I? One who made a hard decision. The right decision, Austin said. Michelle's hands flew and she was beating on Austin's chest before she knew what was happening. He grabbed her hands and she collapsed against his chest, sobbing. She's gone, she whispered. Bella is really gone. Chapter 8 Austin held Michelle close, his emotions all over the board. The raw pain in her voice was unlike anything he had ever heard, but the outburst reminded him too much of Victoria. Michelle's in pain, he reminded himself as she sobbed all over his suit coat jacket. She's not acting like herself. She isn't Victoria. Eventually, Michelle let him lead her from the exam room. Blood streaked her skirt and arms, but the tears had finally stopped. He helped her into the SUV, keenly aware of her puffy eyes and tear-streaked cheeks. Was Wellsprings Pharmaceutical really partially to blame for this? Michelle curled up against the car door, a broken shell of a woman. Is there someone I can call for you? He asked. Silence. Victoria had loved to use the silent treatment when they disagreed. He shook his head, forcing the thoughts out. It wasn't fair to compare the two women. Victoria had never loved something as much as Michelle had obviously loved Bella. He pulled into Michelle's driveway and walked her to the front door. Someone must have closed it, Michelle murmured. What? I don't think I closed the door when I went outside. Austin's back stiffened. I should check the house. I'll be fine. Michelle pushed open the door before he could stop her. Shell? A man appeared in the hallway, his shaggy brown hair falling into his eyes. He rushed forward, wrapping Michelle in his arms. What's wrong? I came by and your front door was open. I called your cell, but you left it on the counter. Bella's gone. Michelle choked, burying her face in the man's chest. Austin took a step back, surprised at the disappointment that filled him. It was good Michelle had a man to lean on. She'd said she was single, but that didn't mean she wasn't dating. The man held Michelle close, murmuring soothing words. I'm Hudson, he said over the top of Michelle's head. Hudson, wasn't that her cousin's name? It sounded familiar. Austin's shoulders relaxed. I'm Austin. I know who you are, Hudson said. Austin couldn't tell if that was a good thing or a bad thing. What happened? 
Austin stood on the front porch and quietly explained the situation while Michelle kept her face buried against Hudson's chest. Austin ached to be the one comforting her. Had he ever met a woman with a bigger heart? The arguments of the past week slipped away and all the emotions of their mistletoe kiss came rushing back. Thank you for helping her, Hudson said quietly. I can take it from here. Austin wanted to protest, but he nodded. Call me if you need anything, he told Michelle. Just go, please, she whispered, her voice muffled. She might as well have doused him in ice water. Things had changed for him tonight, but apparently they hadn't changed for her. His shoulders slumped and he walked away. Michelle didn't call him the next day. Austin couldn't stop thinking about the blank, empty expression in her eyes, one eerily similar to Bella's sightless ones. Was Wellsprings Pharmaceutical really wrong to practice animal testing? Mark's response to showing off the test labs had worried him. Austin wasn't sure what the right answer was, but seeing Bella at least helped him understand Michelle's point of view. He couldn't stop worrying about her. Was she still crying? Had she eaten anything today? What would she do without Bella? At least she had Hudson to comfort her. Around noon, Austin called a florist and had a bouquet of flowers delivered to her house. It was a poor condolence, but better than nothing. Then he called the test labs and arranged to take a tour of the facility Monday morning. He was no longer willing to accept his superior's answers at face value. Austin tried to distract himself by taking the kids to a movie and then out for ice cream. They decided to pick up ready-baked pizzas for dinner on the way home. Whatever did or didn't happen with Michelle, he had the kids, and that meant everything would be okay. By the time they pulled into the driveway again, even Mariah was laughing. Let's play a game, Spencer said as they poured into the kitchen. His eyes were bright with an excitement Austin hadn't seen in months. He'd happily play whatever game Spencer mentioned all night to keep the carefree, light feeling that had permeated the house. Sure. Austin set the pizzas in the fridge. What did you have in mind? Monopoly, Spencer smirked. Mrs. Benson says I'm really good at math. I bet I can beat you, Dad. No way, Austin said. He was definitely letting Spencer win tonight. Mariah rolled her eyes, but her phone stayed tucked in her jeans pocket. No one can beat Dad. I can, Spencer said. Just watch me. Can I play too? Sydney begged. I'm big enough now, right, Dad? Absolutely, Austin said. We'll all play this time. The infectious laughter of his children almost made Austin forget about Michelle. Almost. Victoria had never participated in family activities, but Austin couldn't see Michelle talking on the phone in her bedroom while everyone else in the family hung out. He'd bet she was really good at Monopoly, too. Park Place, Spencer crowed, eagerly counting out his money. I'm buying it. No way. Mariah grabbed the money and recounted it. She threw it back at Spencer with a grumble while he laughed. Dang it! You do have enough money. Told you I'd win, Spencer said. The doorbell chimed, echoing through the house. Austin looked at the kids in surprise. Did you invite friends over tonight? We don't have friends yet, Mariah said, handing Spencer the property card. Maybe it's your friend, Daddy, Sydney said. Austin hid a grin. I'll go see. It was probably some college student selling ridiculously overpriced knife sets. He'd have to pick up a no-soliciting sign the next time he went shopping. Austin opened the door, ready to tell the kid to scram. His jaw fell slack. Michelle stood on the front porch, looking oddly out of place in cuffed jeans, a loose-fitting tee, and converse. Her hair was pulled up in some sort of bun on the top of her head, and her face looked refreshingly clear of makeup. Michelle was here. Hi, she said quietly. Sorry to bother you on a Saturday, but I had to come by before I lost my nerve. 
How did you know where I live? Austin asked. Her cheeks pinked. I checked Sydney's school file. I'm so sorry. I know that's really unprofessional. I'm just surprised. Please come in. Austin stood back and motioned her inside. He'd half expected to never see her again outside of school after last night. Michelle shifted from foot to foot, then finally took a step inside, shutting the door behind her. But she didn't leave the front entryway. Austin folded his arm so he wouldn't be tempted to pull her into an embrace. How are you doing? Better, but still not great. I am so sorry for my behavior last night, Austin. You were nothing but a perfect gentleman, and I took all my anger and sorrow and threw it up all over you. I was completely out of line. His gut impression of Michelle had been right. She was nothing like Victoria. Thank you for apologizing, but I understand why you did it. That doesn't make it right. Austin offered her a tentative smile. We've all done things we regret. He was still trying to decide if working for Wellsprings Pharmaceutical fell into that category. Something about you makes me lose my mind and act completely ridiculous. Her cheeks grew even rosier from a blush. I always leave our encounters feeling like a complete fool. The feeling is mutual. Austin took a step closer and slowly brushed away a lock of her hair. Thank you for the flowers, she whispered. Her breath washed over his face, a mixture of toothpaste and watermelon, maybe from the lip gloss that gave her mouth an enticing shine. It was nothing. It definitely wasn't nothing. It meant a lot to know that someone was worried about me. She stared at the floor. I told one of my friends from their only voice about Bella, and I've gotten a few texts from the group, but they haven't even sent me flowers. Dad, it's your turn, Mariah hollered from the kitchen. Michelle took a step back. I should let you go. I just wanted to apologize for my behavior. Dad, Sydney said, drawing the word out into two syllables. He heard the patter of feet, then Sydney slid to a halt just inside the entryway. Miss Collins, what are you doing at my house? She wrinkled her nose. I've never had a teacher visit me. Hi, Sydney. Are you having a good Saturday? Yes. Daddy took us to see a new movie, and then we got ice cream, and now we're playing a game. She danced across the entryway, grabbing Michelle by the hand. You have to stay and play with us. Monopoly is my favorite game and you're my favorite teacher and now this is the best Saturday ever because I get to have both of the things I love. I really should go home, Michelle said, but she didn't pull away. You don't want to see your teacher on the weekend anyway. Please stay, Sydney said. It'll be so fun. You can eat pizza with us. Yes, please stay. Austin said quietly, echoing his daughter's words. Michelle stared into his eyes and electricity sparked between them. I would really like you to stay. Her green eyes flashed with a thousand emotions Austin couldn't read. But it was impossible to ignore the way her body leaned toward him. He wasn't sure if Michelle was even conscious of the action. Then an emotion he did recognize flashed in her emerald depths. Desire. Okay, Michelle whispered. I'll stay. Chapter 9 Had she seriously just agreed to spend a Saturday afternoon with a student's family? Okay, it wasn't the family Michelle was worried about. It was Sydney's all-too-attractive dad. This felt like a serious step over the teacher-student professional line she had always been so careful not to even tow. Hooray! Sydney cheered, shutting the front door. Austin's eyes were soft and warm. Hooray, he echoed. That one word sent a delicious shiver up Michelle's spine. Their only voice would die if they knew she was here, but Michelle couldn't bring herself to care. 
She'd kicked Hudson out not long after Austin last night, wanting only to be alone. She'd cried all night, hating Austin and the company he worked for. But sometime around 4 a.m., she realized that all the hate in the world wouldn't bring Bella back. Wellspring's pharmaceutical was horrible, no doubt about it, but Austin wasn't. He'd rushed to Bella's aid without a second thought, and in the end, he'd been right to discourage the surgery. It would have been cruel to make Bella continue to suffer. Michelle had texted Autumn first thing that morning, explaining she needed someone else to take her shift at the petition table that afternoon. Autumn had obviously notified the members of their only voice because Michelle had received a handful of texts from the members throughout the morning, but no one had called or dropped by. Did anyone even care that Bella was gone? When Austin's flowers had arrived, Michelle had broken down and sobbed, all her anger disappearing. Suddenly, she had to see him. She wanted his strong, comforting arms to wrap around her in a warm embrace the same way she wanted Bella to return. That desperate need had prompted her to agree to Austin's invitation. Nice Christmas decorations, Michelle joked as Austin led her through the living room. A television hung on one wall and a brown suede sectional filled most of the space, but no decorations hung on the walls and no Christmas tree filled the empty corner of the room. Austin rubbed his chin, a rueful smile turning up a corner of his mouth. I keep meaning to get to that. Things have been crazy lately. Lucy said she'd help us decorate a tree, Sydney said. Lucy? Michelle asked. The college girl I hired to help out, Austin said. Oh, right. Black hair, kind of short, Michelle asked. That's her, Austin said. I've seen her at the school once or twice. Michelle was glad someone was helping out the family. We don't have a Christmas tree, but we do have pizza. Austin walked through an archway and into the kitchen, and Michelle let out a gasp. I'd sell a kidney for this kitchen, Michelle said. She ran a finger over the stainless steel double ovens. One day I'm having these ovens. Yeah, the real estate agents seemed to think that this kitchen was a big selling point, too, Austin said. Two kids looked over from the table where a board game was spread out between them. Kids, this is Miss Collins, Sydney's teacher. Michelle gave a small wave. She recognized Spencer immediately with his dark chocolate hair and startling blue eyes. She'd seen him around school a few times. Mariah looked more like Sydney with ash blonde hair and porcelain skin. Hi, guys, she said. Thanks for letting me crash your party. Sorry about your dog, Spencer said. Dad told us. Michelle swallowed, blinking back tears. She wouldn't cry today. Thank you. Austin cleared his throat. Mariah, will you preheat the oven to 425 degrees? He pulled two uncooked pizzas wrapped in plastic out of the fridge. He glanced over at Michelle. Do you like pizza? I'm a vegan, so I don't eat cheese or eggs, but I'm not really that hungry. No problem. We'll find you something you can eat. Wow. He was probably the first guy to ever say that. Well, except the members of their only voice, but she had never wanted to date one of them. I can't want to date Austin either she reminded herself, except she totally did. Austin returned to the fridge, grabbing a large bag of mixed salad. Uh, vegans eat salad, right? Yes, we eat salad. She hid a smile, her heart warming at how casually he had taken her unusual eating habits. Austin was a good man, and she'd misjudged him. Their only voice had misjudged him. You don't eat any animal byproducts? Mariah said, not even attempting to hide the disdain in her voice. So what, you only eat fruit and vegetables? That's not even healthy. I also eat grains and nuts. Michelle washed her hands in the sink and grabbed the salad, dumping it into the bowl. She wouldn't let Mariah get to her. That's stupid, Mariah said. Mariah? Austin said, his tone rough with a reprimand. Mariah rolled her eyes and pulled out her phone. You don't eat steak? Spencer asked. Nope, Michelle said. 
Do you get angry at people who do? Michelle hit a laugh. No, it's a choice I've made for myself, but I don't expect everyone to make the same one. Does that apply to more than just food? Austin asked quietly. Michelle stared into his eyes as the words sank in. Did she really expect Austin to give up a job that supported his family simply because the company supported practices Michelle was morally opposed to? She didn't exactly like the standardized testing she had to make sure all her students passed. She thought it impeded learning, even, but that didn't mean she was going to stop being a teacher. No job was perfect. I don't know, she said honestly. This past week has been... confusing. For me, too. Austin looked away and cleared his throat. So do you only eat healthy stuff? Uh, no. I make a mean caramel corn. He felt the connection between them, too. Was she willing to pursue it despite all the risks? Michelle motioned to the limp salad. Do you mind if I doctor this up a bit? Be my guest. Daddy doesn't know how to cook, Sidney said. Hey, now, Austin must her hair. I made macaroni and cheese last week without any problems. That's because Mariah helped you, Sidney said. Michelle laughed. Do you like to cook, Mariah? The girl barely glanced up from her phone. I guess. The oven beeped and Austin slipped the first pizza in. You kids make it sound like I'm hopeless. Mariah did put her phone away this time, and the look she gave her father was full of affection. You kind of are. Our housekeeper in Las Vegas was teaching me how to cook, too, Spencer said. My cookies are pretty good. He squinted up at Michelle. Do you eat cookies? If they don't use eggs. Michelle grabbed a cucumber from the fridge and found a cutting board. I have a few good cookie recipes. One uses applesauce. Spencer wrinkled his nose. That sounds disgusting. I bet you wouldn't even notice the difference, Michelle said. Austin's arm brushed hers as he set a wilted tomato on the counter. It would have to do. I'd love to try your cookies sometime, he said. Michelle's heart pounded in her chest and she nodded. It's a date. A slow smile spread across his face, and her face burned with heat. I didn't mean, here, Miss Collins, Sidney pushed her way between them. I found an avocado. Those are healthy, right? Very, Michelle said, taking the fruit. Thank you. Mariah, phone away, Austin said. Help Sidney set the bar. We'll eat there so we can finish the game after dinner. Spencer, I think the dishwasher needs to be unloaded. Isn't it your day to do that? Michelle watched in admiration as Austin interacted with the children. He was firm without being harsh, and it was obvious the kids adored him. They might have struck out in the mom department, but they had hit a home run when it came to dad. She'd always been a sucker for a man who was good with kids. But Austin was still the parent of one of her students, and he was still helping Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. The kitchen was filled with happy laughter as they worked together to prepare dinner, soothing her bleeding heart. This is what she wanted in her life. A loving husband, great kids, a nice house in the suburbs. The only thing that was missing was the family dog. She missed Bella so much. Maybe she had been hasty to give up on love. This seemed like a life worth fighting for. They sat around the kitchen island, dishing up their plates. So, are you guys doing anything fun tomorrow? Michelle asked. Sounds like you've already had a pretty fun weekend. Mom is taking us to Santa's village, Sidney said, standing on the chair in excitement. Pockets on the chair, Austin said, his tone mild, and Sidney immediately complied. Your mother said she'd try to come. You know she's been very busy lately. Mom promised this time, Spencer said. They have real reindeer there that you can feed and everything. We're not going to Santa's village, Mariah said, her tone bitter and sharp. Mom will find something more important to do at the last minute. She always does.
Michelle caught Austin's eye across the island, her heart breaking. His lips were pursed into a hard line and she could see the pain he was hiding from his children. Your mom loves you very much, Austin said. Mom loves money and Roberto, Mariah said. We're barely even an afterthought. Michelle wanted to reach across the counter and wrap all three children in a tight hug. Mommy loves me, Sydney said, her lip trembling. Guys, let's not talk about this anymore, Austin said, his voice stern. There's no use getting upset over something that might not even happen. It will happen, Mariah said. You'll see. A phone rang and Austin pulled it from his pocket. His entire face darkened. A muscle spasmed in his tightly clenched jaw. Brows furrowed over dark eyes that were now narrowed. Excuse me, I need to take this. He rose and left the room. It's mom, Mariah said, her tone dark. He only gets that angry look when she calls. Michelle's heart broke for this family, for Austin. She couldn't imagine watching her children suffer like this. Wellsprings Pharmaceutical might be evil, but Austin most definitely was not. She didn't care what their only voice said. So, Mariah, Michelle said, trying to change the direction of the conversation. How do you like being at the junior high? It's okay, I guess. She slumped in her chair. What subject's your favorite? Michelle prodded. I like the labs we get to do in biology. I always enjoyed that class, too, Michelle said, except when they'd had to dissect the frog. She'd staged a protest outside the school with a picket line and everything that day. What about you, Spencer? Do you like science? Michelle kept up a tense conversation with the kids for the next few minutes, but everyone grew quiet when Austin came back into the room and took his seat. He cleared his throat dark shadows underneath his eyes. Well, that was your mother. She's not coming, Mariah said, her tone bitter and eyes dim. Roberto is receiving an award this weekend and she feels like she really needs to support him. So basically her boyfriend's more important than her kids, Mariah said. Sounds about right. Spencer looked down at his plate and Sidney's lip trembled. Anger warred with sorrow in Michelle's heart. How could a mother ignore her children? We can still go to Santa's village, Austin said. Let's go first thing tomorrow. We'll take the horse-drawn sleigh and feed the reindeer and drink hot chocolate and whatever else you want to do. It's not the same, Spencer said. I know. Austin's voice broke. But I think we'll still have fun. Michelle looked at Austin across the table. His eyes were awash with sadness, and she wanted to wrap her arms around him and apologize for his ex-wife's actions. But maybe she should leave instead. This felt like a private family matter. I miss Mommy, Sydney said, her bottom lip trembling. Austin scooted away from the bar and pulled her onto his lap, dropping a kiss on the top of her head. I know, Pumpkin, but hey... We can still have a lot of fun. And the fun starts right now. What do you want to do tonight? Sydney looked across the table at Michelle. Maybe you could make us that caramel popcorn and we could watch a movie? She suggested hopefully. Austin buried his head in Sydney's hair, and Michelle thought she caught a glimmer of tears in his eyes. If caramel corn and a movie would help this family feel better, even for a few hours, she would do it. Sure, Michelle said, but I'm going to need some big helpers in the kitchen to make sure we get it just right. Chapter 10 The knife that had lodged in Austin's back when Victoria called slipped loose. Michelle was staying. The excitement of his three children's faces had his heart somewhere in the region of his esophagus, and he struggled to keep his emotions from showing. Michelle gathered loose mocha-colored curls into her hands and slipped a rubber band around them, utterly distracting him. Austin, want to turn on some Christmas music? Sure. 
He'd run out to the store and buy a stereo right now if she asked him to. Luckily, the house was wired with Bluetooth speakers, and soon the rich timber of Bing Crosby singing White Christmas filled the kitchen. A grin split Spencer's face as Sidney bounced to the music. Perfect, Michelle said. Let's pull over a chair for you to stand on, Sidney. I guess you guys have popcorn, right? We do. Spencer scampered over to the pantry. Sometimes Lucy makes it for us. Excellent, Michelle said. Mariah, can you grab the brown sugar and vanilla? Let's see, we'll also need baking soda and salt. Hmm, I guess you don't have any coconut oil or dairy-free margarine, do you? I don't think so, Austin said. They sold that at grocery stores, right? The closest one was only a five-minute drive. Mariah rolled her eyes and disappeared into the pantry. She emerged with a giant white tub, a bright blue label slapped on the front. When did we get coconut oil? Austin asked. I asked Lucy to buy it, Mariah said. My cooking teacher said it's great to fry things in. Excellent, Michelle said. You guys won't believe how yummy this caramel corn is. I don't see any caramel, Sydney said. We're making our own. Michelle opened a cupboard, her hips swaying to the music. Where are your pans? Austin ripped his eyes from Michelle's figure. Pans, did they even have those, or had Victoria taken them in the divorce? Uh... Mariah sighed, opened a cupboard on the island, and pulled out a pan. Will this work? Guilt gnawed at Austin. It wasn't fair to Mariah that she'd had to take on so many household responsibilities since Victoria left. Perfect, Michelle said. Now... Who can tell me what caramel is made out of? Spencer glanced at the ingredients on the counter. Brown sugar? Bingo, Michelle said. It depends on who's making it, but caramel is basically butter, sugar, cream, and vanilla. We're going to use baking soda and coconut oil instead of butter and cream. You won't even be able to tell the difference. Promise. I've never made caramel before, Mariah said. Her phone remained shoved in her pocket, and Austin's happiness compounded. It's easy, Michelle said. Here, I'll teach you. What can I help with? Austin asked. Michelle waved her hand. Just sit at the bar and watch. I've got the perfect helpers right here. For the next hour, Austin watched as Michelle patiently taught Mariah how to make caramel corn, with Spencer and Sydney assisting. The kids started out timid and quiet, but by the end, the entire kitchen was filled with rich laughter. Austin was sure this recipe took Michelle half the time to prepare on her own, but she never once showed signs of frustration or complained. The kids were so desperate for positive female attention, all of them, and Michelle provided exactly that. The hurt, cold woman from last night had completely disappeared. Was this the real Michelle, or was this a mask she wore when convenient? He'd thought he knew Victoria, too. But this felt different. Michelle felt different. It smells so good, Sydney said, bouncing up and down on her chair in time to jingle bells. Michelle laughed, giving the popcorn another turn with a wooden spoon Austin hadn't even known they had. Hold still, Sid. I don't want you to fall and hurt yourself. I didn't know making caramel was so easy, Mariah said. She'd put on an apron at some point and looked truly happy for the first time in months. Sugar granules clung to the fabric, and Austin thought he could see the shine of coconut oil on one cheek. I'll write down the recipe before I leave, Michelle said. That way you can make it on your own if you want to. You think I can do that? The hopeful note in Mariah's voice killed Austin. Had Victoria ever praised the girl for anything? Absolutely. Michelle said. All done. Spencer, grab five plates and we'll give it a try. Spencer did as he was asked, and soon they all sat around the island, a plate of caramel corn in front of each of them. Dig in, Michelle said. Austin picked a piece up of the sticky mixture. Popcorn without butter didn't sound too appetizing, but he would eat the entire plate and act like it was the best thing ever. 
he took a large bite, prepared for a flavorless, soggy mess. Holy cow! Not only was Michelle funny, compassionate, great with his kids, and gorgeous, she was also an amazing cook. He was never letting her leave. The popcorn gave a satisfying crunch, and the flavor burst in his mouth, sweet and smooth with just a hint of coconut that somehow added to the overall taste. I love it, Sydney explained from her bar stool. Michelle laughed. Don't act so surprised. I can't even tell it's vegan, Mariah said. Spencer gave a thumbs up and smiled, revealing a mouthful of half-chewed popcorn. Manor Spencer, Austin said. This really is delicious, Michelle. You're not just saying that? She asked. I was skeptical at first, but you've made me a believer. You can cook vegan for us any time. They grabbed their bowls, napkins, and drinks, then settled into the sectional to watch a Christmas movie. Sidney and Spencer immediately claimed the spots on either side of Michelle, and before the movie was half over, Sidney was asleep, her head resting against Michelle's shoulder. Austin watched the tender scene, a terrifying and exciting realization settling over him. He was falling for Michelle. She glanced over, as though sensing his gaze, and gave him a small smile. His arm ached to rest around her shoulders. How had she managed to patch the hole in their lives so quickly? He'd bet his career that the children had completely forgotten about Victoria's abandonment while they made popcorn. By the time the movie ended, Spencer was asleep as well, and Mariah was fading fast. Austin picked up the remote and clicked off the TV silence filling the room. We bored them clear to sleep, Michelle said quietly. Austin gave a low chuckle. They're just tired. Let me get these two upstairs and I'll come back for her, he pointed to Sydney. I'm not going anywhere, Michelle said. It felt like a promise, one he very much wanted to accept. Austin nudged Spencer awake and guided both him and Mariah up the stairs and into their bedrooms. When he came back downstairs, Sydney was still nestled against Michelle's side. I hate to wake her up, Michelle said. She looks so peaceful. I'll carry her. She sleeps like the dead anyway. We couldn't wake her up if we tried. We. He liked how effortlessly the word had slipped from his lips. His hand brushed against Michelle's shoulder as he gently lifted Sydney. She let out a mumble before settling against his shoulder her warm breath puffing against his neck. Be right back, Austin whispered. Michelle nodded. When Austin returned a few minutes later, he found Michelle washing dishes in the kitchen. You don't need to do that, he said. I don't mind. Here, you can dry while I wash. She smirked. You do know where the dish towels are, don't you? Yes, he said, and it only took two wrong drawers before he found the right one. Michelle handed him a small bowl and he toweled it off. We do have a dishwasher, you know. I know, but I like hand-washing things. It's soothing, plus it saves energy. I do my best thinking while I'm washing dishes. He took another bowl from her. How long had it been since he'd felt like a team with a woman, even in such a mundane task? He and Victoria had never truly worked together. They'd always been half a beat out of sync. And what are you thinking about now? Michelle flicked a glance in his direction. I'm not sure I should say. I think that means you definitely should tell me. It'll sound judgmental. Out with it. She sighed. I'm thinking about your ex-wife. How can she stand not to be with those kids? They're so great, all of them. Mariah is responsible and picks up on things very quickly, and Spencer jumps right in and helps without asking, and Sydney is so sweet. They're all polite and respectful, and they're so funny. This was the best evening I've had in a long time. Austin took the last bowl from her hands, their fingers just brushing. Victoria is someone I never should have married. She was always a free spirit. That's what attracted me to her initially. It didn't take long after we had Mariah for me to realize Victoria didn't really want to be a mother. 
but birth control isn't always effective, and we ended up with Spencer and Sydney. I was thrilled, but she got worse and worse with each child. I'm so sorry, Austin. I can't imagine how heartbreaking this is for you. It's beyond heartbreaking. But seeing you with them tonight was incredible. I don't know if I can ever thank you enough. She blushed, looking down. I'm glad I could distract them from their disappointment for even a few hours. He reached out, brushing his knuckles along her cheekbone. You've definitely distracted me. Her breathing stuttered. I should get going. Okay. But he didn't step back, and neither did she. He searched her face and saw the longing he felt reflected there. He took another step closer, but then she did break away, taking a few steps back. Thank you again for tonight, she said. He stuck his hands in his pockets and nodded. Will you be okay at home? Her eyes filled with tears, but she quickly blinked them back. Last night was hard, but I'll be okay. Let me walk you to your car. Michelle nodded. He waited for her to slip into her shoes and jacket, then followed her into the chilly December air. She unlocked her car door, then turned to face him. Can I call you sometime? He asked. Okay. She gave a little laugh. I guess that means you need my number. Yeah, I guess it does. Give me yours and I'll send you a text. He rattled off his number and his phone buzzed in his pocket a moment later. There. She leaned forward and Austin wrapped his arms around her. She melded against his body perfectly and he inhaled her watermelon scent. She dropped her arms and he reluctantly let her go. Good night, she whispered. Good night, he said. She climbed into her car and drove off. Austin stood on the sidewalk, watching until her taillights disappeared. Then he fished out his phone. The text icon blinked and he opened it. The text was only five words. I miss you already. Michelle. Chapter 11 She'd almost let him kiss her. Michelle drove home on autopilot, replaying the evening over in her mind. Sydney and Spencer had warmed up to her almost immediately, and by the end of the night, even Mariah had relaxed. Michelle had loved teaching the kids how to make caramel popcorn, had loved it when the two youngest snuggled up against her for the movie. She'd caught Austin watching her more than once, and each instant sent warm shivers up her spine and whispered of a promise she wasn't sure she should accept. She knew he liked her. The electricity that sparked between them each time they met was undeniable, but she wasn't sure what to do about it. On Sunday, Michelle wandered aimlessly around the house, aching for Bella. She pulled out her phone more than once to text Austin, but each time put it back untouched. She'd see him tomorrow at the Christmas assembly, and she didn't want to interrupt family time. Had he taken the kids to Santa's village? Were the kids having a good time, or was the visit a painful reminder of their mother's abandonment? Michelle wanted to wrap that entire family in a hug and never let them go. They deserved so much better. On Monday morning, Michelle dressed carefully, mindful of the media that would be present at the assembly. She looked back and forth between the green A-line dress with the three-quarter length sleeves and the black lacy skirt with a white silk blouse. Which would Austin like more? She chewed on her lip, holding both outfit up to her chin as she gazed into the mirror. His opinion shouldn't matter. The green dress was less formal and therefore more appropriate for work. He probably wouldn't even notice that it was the exact same shade as her eyes. At ten o'clock, she led her students in a single-file line to the gym, nerves making her hands clammy. Their only voice would know of her betrayal by the weekly meeting that afternoon. But was it really a betrayal? The children were being given an amazing opportunity to learn about conservation efforts at one of the world's foremost zoos. And while Wellsprings Pharmaceutical might be the bad guy, Austin was good to the core. The children sat on the floor, legs crossed, and Michelle sank into a chair at the end of the row. 
Three reporters with cameras slung around their necks stood at the back of the room. Michelle nervously patted her hair. Where was Austin? He might be hiding backstage right now. She shivered, aching to see him again. What was wrong with her? I figured that after a decade of searching, she'd find herself falling for a guy who was completely wrong and completely right simultaneously. Why did he have to work for Wellsprings? She thought of Bella and some of her anger returned. The principal walked out onto the stage and a chorus of shh filled the room as teachers quieted their students. Michelle's heart was going to pound through her chest like an uncontrolled sledgehammer. Excitement at seeing Austin again warred with dread at facing their only voice tonight. Good morning, boys and girls, and happy holidays, Principal Rhodes said. The mic screeched, and she quickly pulled it away from her mouth while the kids covered their ears and laughed. We've got a really fun assembly planned today, and we're kicking it off with an exciting announcement. I'd like to welcome Sidney and Spencer's dad, Mr. O'Neill, onto the stage. Scattered clapping sounded around the room, mostly from the faculty. Austin strode onto the stage, his steps long and confident. A red Santa hat was perched on his head at a jaunty angle, and a smile tugged at Michelle's lips. This wasn't the first time he had made Christmas look good. An image of mistletoe flashed into her mind, but she pushed it away. Austin took the mic from Principal Rhodes, causing another screech of feedback from the ancient system. Thank you, he said, his lips looking way too enticing as they formed the words. He waved a hand and a wave. Hey, guys, I'm here today because I work for a company called Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, and we wanted to give all you awesome kids a Christmas present. Can anyone tell me what pharmaceutical means? A hand tugged at her skirt, and Michelle looked down to see Sydney smiling up at her. That's my dad she whispered. Michelle barely held back a chuckle. Yes, he is, sweetie. That's right, Austin was saying. My company makes new medicines to help sick people. Our medicines can even save people's lives. And sometimes, to make sure those medicines are safe, we test things first on animals. Michelle's smile froze and her posture stiffened. Austin continued to talk about how much Wellsprings Pharmaceutical wanted to help the community, and her anger continued to rise. Had Austin forgotten about Bella? He couldn't honestly be saying these things. Miss Collins, will you join me on stage? She wanted so badly to yell no and walk out of the room. But one look at the eager faces of her students convinced her otherwise. She wouldn't take this away from them. Michelle rose, gracefully, she hoped, and walked to the front of the room, hoping her smile looked natural instead of angry. Austin offered her a wide smile, and she felt some of her anger fade. What was happening to her? A good-looking man didn't mean she could suddenly forget all about her principles. She took her place beside Austin, staring into the bright lights that beat down on the stage. Austin reached off stage and brought out a giant golden ticket, at least six feet long. On behalf of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, we would like to present a field trip to the San Diego Zoo, complete with transportation and sack lunches to each student at this school. The gym erupted with cheers and students leapt to their feet, clapping. Gratitude warred with hatred inside Michelle as she took the ticket from Austin and forced a smile. Why couldn't he work for PETA or something? It would make everything in her life so much easier. Principal Rhodes raised a meaningful eyebrow from her place just off stage, and Michelle took the microphone from Austin. Thank you so much for providing our school with this amazing opportunity to teach our students about endangered species and conservation efforts so that we can make our world a better place. She could thank Austin, but she wouldn't thank Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Couldn't. She thought back over his speech and knew Ruth would be livid at the meeting tonight. Principal Rhodes walked onto stage, holding up a hand for the students to settle down. Wow, she said. We cannot thank Wellsprings Pharmaceutical enough. We will eagerly look forward to our trip this coming February. 
Let's give Mr. O'Neill and Miss Collins another round of applause. Clapping filled the gym along with a few cheers. Austin raised his hand one last time in farewell, then rested it at the small of Michelle's back and led her off stage. The hallway was eerily quiet, the sound of the continuing assembly muffled by the closed gym doors. Austin's grin was all teeth, his eyebrows raised in excitement. I think they liked it. They loved it. Michelle looked at the floor, drawing a circle with the toe of her shoe. This is a great opportunity for the students, and I'm glad they're going to experience it. He rested his hands in his pockets, a line forming between his brows. You're still upset. You basically told the kids that animal testing is okay. I personally believe it can be okay in certain circumstances. Animals don't react to medications the same way humans do. It makes testing drugs on them pointless. He reached out, his finger stopping just short of her cheek. He let out a sigh and dropped his hand. Regardless, I hope you understand the position I'm in. I'm here to represent Wellsprings Pharmaceuticals' interests, not my own. She nodded, but it wasn't that easy to separate Austin from Wellsprings. I wanted to thank you for Saturday night. The kids all went to bed with smiles on their faces instead of crying, and that's because of you. Michelle grasped at the subject change like a lifeline. Did you end up going to Santa's village? Yes. The kids were quieter than normal, but we had a good day. At least Victoria didn't steal that from them as well. He offered her a small smile, a truce. Sydney mentioned three times that she wished you could have come with us. I think Spencer and Mariah missed you too. They're great kids. I missed them yesterday. I missed all of you. And how are you doing? It's been hard, but I'm holding on. He nodded, electricity crackling between them. Austin had his weight balanced on the balls of his feet, leaning toward her, and she knew he wanted to hold her as much as she wanted to be held. She took a step back, clearing her throat. I'd better get back to my students. If I'm not there to keep them quiet, they get rowdy fast. Of course. I'll see you around? Yes. Michelle quickly walked away, feeling Austin's eyes follow her until the gym doors once again shut. By lunch, the local paper had posted an article about the assembly, and by the time school was out, Michelle had seen it shared online at least a dozen times. Parents were ecstatic, and it seemed that the public's opinion of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical had already shifted to a more positive slant. Ruth would be furious. After school, Michelle headed to the library for the weekly meeting with their only voice, apprehension making her stomach churn. You did nothing wrong she reminded herself. The children deserved this field trip, and Principal Rhodes hadn't exactly given Michelle a choice. She hid in her car until the last possible minute to avoid chit-chat with the other members of their only voice. The meeting room was already filled with the most active members. Ruth stood at the front of the room, and Doug and Autumn were snuggled up together on the back row. Ten other members were spread across the three rows of seats. Michelle slipped into a seat next to Autumn. Where have you been? Autumn hissed. Michelle shrugged. Ruth asked me if you were coming at least three times, Autumn said. Ruth let out a grunt, her back toward the room as she taped papers on the whiteboard. Michelle closed her eyes, trying to calm her racing heart. There would be no running today. A full-page photo of her accepting the golden ticket immediately captured her attention. Ruth knew, just as Michelle had known she would. Seems Wellsprings Pharmaceutical has hired a marketing director who actually knows what he's doing, Ruth said. This afternoon, Mr. O'Neill announced that Wellsprings would be funding a field trip to the San Diego Zoo for an entire school. Anyone care to guess who accepted the golden ticket? Everyone turned in their seats, staring at Michelle. You accepted a bribe? A college kid with a mohawk demanded from the front row. I thought you said you barely knew him, a middle-aged woman exclaimed. Michelle sank lower in her chair, frustration with Austin welling within her. How dare he put her in this position? But asking her had been a strategic move.
one she would have made herself had their roles been reversed, and he'd asked before they'd become friends. How could you let him get to you like that? Autumn asked, her expression hurt. Michelle sat up, her frustration shifting from Austin to the room. What was I supposed to do? Deny 500 students the opportunity to interact with animals at the San Diego Zoo? I wasn't about to ruin this for my students. You didn't have to be the one to receive the donation, Doug said. My job was on the line. Austin specifically asked me to do it, and my principal told me it was non-negotiable. So your job means more to you than animal rights? Autumn demanded. Michelle looked at her friend, an ache settling over her entire body. Did Autumn not know Michelle at all? She closed her eyes, recalling the terror that had gripped her as she sneaked Bella out of the lab in a duffel bag all those years ago. Absolutely not. But allowing the kids to visit a world-class zoo isn't hurting anyone. If anything, it's helping us raise a new generation of activists. Michelle, you've always been very loyal to our cause, Ruth said. But I'm beginning to think you have a personal relationship with Mr. O'Neill that's impeding your judgment. That's not true. Austin and I are acquainted, but our friendship isn't making me go soft. If anything, their only voice was impeding her relationship with Austin, not the other way around. If you have his ear, you should push our cause as forcefully as possible, Ruth said. I won't take advantage of our friendship that way. We should stage a picket outside his house, Doug said. I bet Michelle knows where he lives now. You've got to be kidding me. Michelle's chest felt tight, and she looked around at the room of angry faces. He has three kids. Staging a protest outside their home would scare those kids to death. She thought of Sidney curled up in a corner of the living room, crying because the angry chanting made her worried. She thought of Spencer growing quiet as the picketers hurled insults at his father. Why should we stop at picketing? Autumn asked. Let's graffiti his driveway. I know a guy who never gets caught. Austin is a good man, Michelle said, raising her voice. Yes, he works for an awful company, but he's a single father trying to support his children. He has a good heart and doesn't deserve any of that. If we want to pick at Wellsprings again, okay, I will be there with a sign. But there's no need to personally attack Wellsprings employees. He's one of them, Autumn said. He's my friend, and he wanted to provide this opportunity for the students at my school. Austin doesn't hate animals. He rushed me and Bella to the vet when she was hit. He brought me flowers after I yelled at him, which is more than I can say for any of you. We're sorry about Bella, Ruth said quickly. We know this is a really hard time for you. But turning to Wellsprings Pharma, I'm not turning to them, Michelle said. I'm turning to Austin, my friend, not Austin, the marketing director. And their only voice doesn't get to comment on my personal life. The Michelle I know would have volunteered to make signs, not told us it was wrong to directly target Mr. O'Neill, Ruth said. Maybe you aren't as dedicated to their only voice as you used to be. Maybe your priorities have changed. Michelle looked around the room, and angry faces glared back at her. She had thought these people were her friends. She had thought they valued peace and compassion as much as she did. You're absolutely right, Ruth. This group is no longer working out for me. I want to work with people who are genuinely concerned about living creatures, all living creatures, not crusaders who don't practice what they preach. Michelle, Autumn said. But Michelle walked out of the room, not turning back even once. Chapter 12 Austin walked into the lab, his nose wrinkling in disgust at the smell. Cages lined two walls and the rustle of tiny feet against bedding filled the otherwise silent space. Blindingly white paint accented gray desks and empty lab tables lined the center of the room. A technician appeared around a shelving unit, a box in one hand. He paused, his face going pale. Mr. O'Neill, I wasn't expecting you until eleven. 
I found out a meeting has been scheduled for that time, so I decided to come early. Is that a problem? Of course not, the technician said quickly. He looked to be in his mid-twenties with a lean build and square glasses. I haven't had a chance to do the morning cleanup yet, sorry. Not a problem, Austin said, although the smell was most definitely a problem. How could scientists work down here? Austin glanced at the boy again. Maybe he was so used to frat houses he had gone nose blind. Well, let me show you around, the technician held out a hand. Sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Rob. I've been here since the beginning of the semester doing research for my graduate program. Nice to meet you, Austin said. Uh, yeah, so this is the main lab room. We keep the animals over there and most of the lab equipment through those doors. Let me show it to you. It's really top of the line. All my school buddies are jealous I get to do my research here. Rob took a step toward the door, but Austin ignored him, instead walking over to the animal cages. The smell grew stronger the closer he got. Austin held his breath, the stench stinging his eyes. He peered into a cage and found a rabbit huddled near the back. Ribs protruded through its fur. Were rabbits supposed to be that thin? Austin wasn't exactly an expert. The smell grew even stronger and he gagged, taking a step back. The animal had just defecated on the already soiled straw. How long since this has been cleaned? Austin asked. Every morning, Rob said quickly. Austin seriously doubted that, and he wasn't above calling this lab technician on his lie. The lab door flew open, bouncing off the wall. A scientist in a white lab coat that matched his hair strode into the room. Mr. O'Neill, he said, extending a hand. I am the lead scientist, Gregory Reed. So sorry I wasn't here when you arrived. Let me show you to our labs. I was just saying hello to the animals, Austin said. Yes, we keep them on a strict schedule and it's better they aren't disturbed. Right this way. Dr. Reed conducted the rest of the tour with an iron-fisted control that left little room to explore the lab or ask questions. With each staged laugh from the doctor, Austin grew more and more suspicious. Were lab animals kept on any sort of schedule? Why was Dr. Reed so determined he not examine the animals closer? That rabbit had been too thin. The cage had been too dirty. Austin had never owned a pet, but this seemed neglectful at the very least. When he left the lab an hour later, it was with a twinge in his gut that had him questioning his superiors. Now he understood why Mark hadn't wanted to offer their only voice a tour. Did this mean Michelle, and by extension their only voice, was right? In the beginning, he'd thought Michelle was a bit of a fanatic. But meeting Bella had changed things. He thought of the ancient beagles stuck in one of those filthy cages and shuddered. He would get to the bottom of this. Back in his office, Austin fired up his computer and started digging through old scanned documents, starting with lab inspections. Was it typical for them to have so much whiteout, with new notes made over the top in different handwriting? He kept reading, comparing copies and documents while the twinge in his gut turned into a knife. He pulled out his personal phone and started taking pictures and making notes as he researched. Then he carefully closed out all the documents and left for the meeting. What was Mark trying to hide? Austin tapped his foot against the carpet as an accountant droned on about the year-end numbers, his mind whirling with conflicting emotions. He should have listened to Michelle. Something had to change. Now we'll turn the time over to Austin for an update on public perception, Mark said. If the public only knew what Wellsprings Pharmaceutical was hiding. Austin rose, buttoning his suit jacket closed. Things have taken a turn in the right direction this week. The kids are extremely excited about the field trip, and the local paper wrote a great piece that's garnered a positive response from the community. It seems we spent the money in the right place. Excellent, Mark said. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. We don't have to be liked to do our job, but it makes things a heck of a lot easier. I've been thinking about that, Austin said. Now might be the perfect time to ride this wave and consider implementing company-wide changes that will improve our test animals' quality of life. We could even begin exploring options to eliminate animal testing completely. 
Mark gave a harsh laugh. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, let's hear from operations. Austin sank back into his chair, not surprised his suggestions had been brushed off so easily. Wellsprings Pharmaceutical had been brushing off a lot. Now he understood what had enticed Michelle to steal Bella from the cosmetic company. That bunny had looked so pathetic in his dirty, dank cage. If Michelle had seen that lab room, he had no doubt she would have tried to set every animal free. Was he wrong to not be doing the same? He wondered how Michelle was really doing without Bella. He'd never owned a pet, but her grief over losing the dog had been real and run deep. She stuck to her convictions in a way that was more than admirable. It was attractive. After seeing that test lab, he appreciated her dedication to her cause even more. No one could ever replace Bella, but he hated the thought of Michelle being all alone. After work, he drove to the animal shelter, a dilapidated building with peeling paint and a faded sign. An employee smiled brightly from behind the reception desk when he entered. Hi, she said. What can I help you with today? Austin stuck his hands in his pockets. A dog. We have lots of those. The perky blonde walked around the desk, ponytails swaying with each step. Let me guess, a Christmas present for someone special. Something like that. She pulled a key ring off a hook on the wall. Are you looking for any specific breed? Austin scratched his chin. Bella had been a beagle. Would Michelle want a dog that reminded her of Bella or someone completely different? I'm not sure. I think I'll know when I see it. The girl unlocked a door and pushed it open, motioning Austin inside. He stepped into a large room lined with cages and was instantly struck with how clean the room smelled. The scent of animal was definitely present, but disinfectant and cleaner layered on top of it. He peered inside a cage. A beige cat looked back at him, a cone around its head. The cat snarled and walked to the back of its cage, revealing a stitched wound on its side. The cat was thin, but clean, the wound obviously healing well. Austin looked into the next cage. A fat tomcat slept near a bowl brimming with water. The bedding inside the cage was clean and fresh, the water crystal clear. The dogs are over here, the girl said, motioning him toward the end of the row. We have volunteers come in the morning, and that's when we let the animals into our fenced yard to stretch. We're a no-kill shelter, and we're very proud of that. Every animal finds a home. Looks like you got a great operation here. Thanks. Our CEO, Ruth, is the president of Their Only Voice as well. Maybe you've heard of them. She's very passionate about animals. Austin ran a hand through his hair, surprise settling over him. Ruth owned this shelter? He remembered reading that in the dossier of information he'd been given on the group now that he thought about it. Here we go, said the girl. She walked over to a cage. This collie has been with us for about a week. Our vet estimates she's six years old and she's got a bit of a limp. But her temperament is very mild, which makes her the perfect dog for a family. Austin peered into the cage, admiring the golden hair on the large dog. She's nice, he said. A small yip sounded from a few cages over. She's a sweetheart, the employee agreed. Her owner actually passed away and no one in the family wanted to deal with her. We've also got a Dalmatian here, which is pretty rare. I think he'll go quickly. Another yip came, this one louder than the first. Are you thinking a puppy or an older dog? The girl asked. That'll help us narrow down our search. The yipping turned into a weak bark. I'm sorry, the girl said. She walked over to a cage and unlocked it. A puppy with hair the color of dark chocolate nearly tumbled out of the cage. Whoa, hold on, girl. Let's get you some food. The employee scratched the dog behind her ears. Sorry, this girl only came in last night. Someone found her in a park and brought her in. She's half starved, but the vet said she'll be just fine with a little food and love. The dog looked up at Austin with large, soulful eyes, eyes that reminded him of Michelle's. The dog let out a bark, louder and stronger than her previous ones. She's female? Austin asked, holding out his hand for the dog to sniff. Yes, a chocolate lab mix, we think. 
She was pretty quiet last night, but after a few square meals, her puppy energy seems to be returning. She's about eight weeks old. The dog licked Austin's fingers, her rough tongue tickling his skin. I'll take her, Austin said. Forty minutes later, he parked on Michelle's curb and reached inside the box, gently coaxing the puppy into his arms. He knocked on the door, worrying this was the worst idea ever. What if Michelle thought he was trying to replace Bella? What if she didn't want to house train a puppy? What if she simply wasn't ready to welcome another dog into her life? The door swung open, and Michelle's eyes immediately wandered from staring up at Austin to the dog in his arms. Hi, she said, her eyes glued to the puppy. Hi. Austin tightened his hold, and the puppy growled, struggling to get free. I thought I'd come by and see how you're doing. I'm doing okay. She reached out a tentative hand, scratching the puppy behind the ears. Is he yours? She, and I thought you might want her. Michelle's eyes widened. You got me a dog? The puppy scrambled up his shoulder and Austin snagged her just in time. I know. As soon as I drove up, I realized how stupid it is. I didn't even stop to think if you'd be ready for a new dog, if you liked labs or even wanted a puppy. Michelle placed a gentle finger on his lips, silencing him immediately. She slowly withdrew her finger, leaving a fire that couldn't be doused. Can I hold her? Oh, sure. Austin transferred the dog into her arms. The puppy let out a yip, but Michelle rubbed behind her ears and cooed nonsensical words. The dog instantly calmed down. She let out a happy bark and settled into Michelle's arms. She's a sweetie, Michelle said. But she looks so thin and so young. Is she big enough to be away from her mama? She doesn't have a mom. Animal control found her shivering and hungry in a city park last night and brought her to the shelter. They told me the vet estimated she was eight weeks old. You poor thing, Michelle crooned but the dog's eyes were already closed, fast asleep. Do you like her? Austin asked, his heart in his throat. Michelle looked up, her eyes ringed with tears. I didn't think I was ready for a new dog, but the second I saw her, I knew I was wrong. Thank you. I've been imagining you lonely and sad, and I didn't want that to be the case for even one more night. When had he taken a step closer? Michelle's green eyes were luminous and her teeth gently pulled at her bottom lip. How did you know I let Bella sleep in my bed? Michelle asked. It just seemed like the kind of thing you'd do. She opened the door wider and stepped back. Would you like to come in? I'd love to. Austin stepped inside and closed the door behind him. Michelle's home was just as he'd imagined it. The walls were painted a cheery butter yellow and garland hung between the sconce lights. She led him into a living room with a rich white shag rug that contrasted beautifully against the dark wood floors. A Christmas tree sat in one corner of the room, decorated entirely in doggy treats. He sat down on the love seat, pushing aside a few throw pillows to make room. I can't believe you got me a new dog, Michelle said. No one's ever done something so nice for me. The second I saw her, I knew you two were made for each other. What are you going to name her? Lola, I think. The dog gave a large yawn, then settled back in her arms. Michelle smiled. Yes, Lola suits her perfectly. Austin steepled his fingers, staring at the ground before looking back up at Michelle. What's going on between us, Michelle? Her cheeks turned pink and she looked away. I don't know. But what I do know is that today I quit their only voice, an organization I've been dedicated to for years because they wouldn't stop insulting your character. And I didn't feel the least bit of remorse as I walked away. All the air left his lungs. I'm, I'm sorry. I never meant for our association to cause problems for you. Michelle smiled, gently scratching behind Lola's ears. I'm not. If they can't see what a good man you are, then I don't want any part of their organization. Michelle, she held up a hand. 
I've been burned by a lot of relationships in the past. Every time I get close to a man, he decides I'm too young or too serious or too animal-obsessed. The basic facts still remain. You work for a company I hate, I'm your daughter's teacher, and a slew of other complications could arise. But this is the most alive I've felt in years. Me too, he whispered, letting his fingers gently caress her cheek. Her skin was as smooth as silk, and a delicious ache welled inside him. Michelle leaned into his hand, then pulled away. And that was okay. I would very much like to take you out on a date, Austin said. Michelle smiled, her entire face softening. Okay. Austin left Michelle's, resolve filling him. He wanted to be like her, strong in her convictions even when the cost was high. After the kids were in bed, he sat in his home office and looked over all the information he'd collected on Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Those documents had to have been altered. Information didn't add up, and the pit in his gut told him that he'd stumbled across something big, something life-changing. He picked up a picture frame near his monitor, staring into the face of his three children. Would he want them to take the safe route that promised job security, or do the right thing, no matter the consequences? Which man did he want to be? He pulled out his phone and looked at the picture he had snapped of Michelle and Lola, memorizing the lines of her face. She'd stolen Bella knowing she'd have to quit her job. She had left their only voice because they were slandering him. She always made the hard choice. And so could he. Chapter 13 Michelle floated through the next few days. Lola was an energetic puppy with a playful personality, and Michelle poured her love into the dog. She still missed Bella, but Lola helped fill the void. She couldn't believe Austin had done something so kind for her. He invaded her thoughts at the most unexpected of moments, and she found herself looking forward to their nightly texts with an anticipation that scared her. She saw him briefly during the second-grade Christmas program, sitting on the front row with a proud smile as he watched Sydney sing. Michelle was distracted all through the program, but the children didn't seem to notice and sang their songs beautifully. Michelle dismissed the students, and Sydney ran down the stage steps, throwing herself into Austin's waiting arms. You were amazing, Austin said. I didn't forget any of the words, Sydney said. I know, I'm so proud of you. Austin straightened, giving Michelle a smile that had her stomach doing cartwheels. We're still on for tomorrow? Seven o'clock, Michelle confirmed. I can't wait. He wrapped an arm around Sydney and motioned to the refreshment table. Let's go get a cookie before I have to head back to work. Chloe said there are chocolate cookies, Sydney said as the pair walked away. Michelle watched them, her attraction toward Austin growing by the second. The next day, the children were rambunctious, eager for the final bell to ring so they could start their vacation. Michelle wasn't much better than her students. She couldn't wait to go out with Austin that night. School let out with a burst of excited laughter and calls of Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Michelle cranked up her favorite local radio station on the drive home, enjoying the holiday music and the excitement of the season. She loved Christmas and everything about it. Maybe Austin would invite her over during the break. She'd love to spend another evening making caramel popcorn and watching Christmas movies with his family. The song ended and the radio announcer came on. Good afternoon, he said. Schools are out for the holiday break and parents everywhere are wondering how they'll survive the next few weeks. Michelle laughed. It's not going to be a Merry Christmas for everyone, John, the female announcer said. The much-discussed Wellspring Pharmaceutical just announced this morning that testing of a new anti-seizure medication has been halted due to adverse effects on test animals. The FDA has sent them a cease-and-desist letter. All 20 rabbits in the trial have suffered neurological damage due to the effects of the drug. Michelle's ears started buzzing, and her chest felt tight. That's unfortunate timing for Wellsprings, John said, but I still think they're the good guys. 
They donated all that money to send students to the San Diego Zoo for crying out loud. Unfortunate timing for them. What about the bunnies? The female announcer demanded. Michelle's fingers curled around the steering wheel. Those poor rabbits. She wanted to rush home to Lola and spend the rest of the evening holding the puppy close. Oh, it's awful what's happened to those animals, no doubt about it, John said. But think how much more tragic it would have been if they had tested the drug on people. Rabbits don't have families to support or people at work depending on them. It wouldn't be more tragic, Michelle yelled at the radio. Life is life. The new marketing director seems to feel the same way you do, the female announcer said. A new ad campaign has already been launched on both the company's website and social media platforms using the hashtag worth the risk. The photo shows a dog looking up into the eyes of a small child and basically playing the martyr card. It's disgusting. Why not a rabbit? The male announcer asked. I guess dogs are more sympathetic. Michelle's blood ran cold. A new ad campaign would have been approved by Austin. She barely heard the rest of the news report. Once home, she raced into her office and flipped on the computer, Lola nipping at her heels. An image filled the main page of the company's website, exactly as the radio announcer had described. A small boy, perhaps two, sat on the floor laughing as a dog licked his cheek. A thought bubble from the dog's mouth said, I'm happy to submit to animal testing so that he never has to deal with the side effects. Hashtag worth the risk. Michelle ran to the trash can and dry heaved, but nothing came up. She stumbled into the living room and sank onto the couch, her knees trembling. Austin had approved this campaign? It was revolting, disgusting. She thought around and around the issue for an hour, trying to find a scenario that didn't put Austin in the wrong. But any marketing campaign would need his okay. Lola let out a little bark and hopped up onto the couch, curling next to Michelle. She placed a hand on Lola's back, needing the reassuring rise and fall of her breath. How could the man who had given her Lola be the man who approved that ad campaign? Which Austin was the real one? The clock ticked closer to seven, but Michelle didn't bother changing clothes or reapplying makeup for her date. She wouldn't be going out with Austin tonight. Her heart cracked, pieces scattering across the floor as her chest heaved with cries she couldn't release. She should call him and cancel, but she wanted to see his face when she confronted him about the ad. When the doorbell finally rang at seven, it echoed throughout the apartment like a death knell. Lola jumped up and barked frantically. Shh, Michelle said, pulling the puppy close. She opened the door and her heart caught in her throat, nearly choking. Austin looked beyond dashing in a maroon button-down shirt and sports coat. Nothing like an animal hater who didn't care if dozens of bunnies suffered brain damage as long as his company made money. How had she been so wrong about him? Hey, he said, giving her wrinkled skirt and blouse a quick once-over. You ready to go? I saw the ad campaign. Michelle forced the words out through her tight lips. How could you? His face turned ashen. You heard about the recall? Yes, and your opinion on the matter has come through loud and clear. What are you talking about? The ad campaign, she screamed. She brought a hand to her face and pinched the bridge of her nose. Lola struggled to get down, but she clutched the puppy even closer. I can't date someone who believes those things, who will make money off the pain and suffering of others. Austin ran a hand through his hair, shifting his weight from foot to foot. I didn't approve that campaign. An intern went over my head to the CEO. Mark loved it and the ad started running without my approval. Michelle barked out a laugh. That's your defense? Just tell me the truth, Austin. That is the truth. Did you know about the effects of the seizure medication on the rabbits? Austin opened his mouth, then closed it. He shoved his hands deep in his pocket, a furrow forming between his brow. It was a recent discovery. And you still work for Wellsprings Pharmaceutical? A muscle in his jaw twitched. Yes. 
even after an intern supposedly went over your head to the CEO? You really expect me to believe that the head of the company is the one making these decisions despite the salary they're paying you? It's complicated. Then explain it to me. Her fingers dug into the metal of the door and she felt paint scuff under the pressure of her nails. Lola barked, scratching at Michelle's arm. I want to understand. He ran a hand through his hair. I want to explain, believe me, if you'll just give me a week or two. I thought you were different. Tears coated her voice, but she refused to let them free. You helped me with Bella. You brought me Lola. But I can't overlook your connection to Wellsprings anymore. Not after this. Wait. Austin lunged, catching the door before she could close it. Michelle, let me... No, Austin! I've given you the chance to explain. It's obvious we have nothing more to say to each other. She slammed the door in his face. A fist pounded against it almost instantly. Don't do this! Lola let out a whine and Michelle clutched her close. Please just leave. Silence. She pressed her eye against the peephole. Austin's eyes were closed, his face scrunched with a pain that clawed at her heart. Slowly, he turned and walked away. Lola nipped at Michelle's finger and she let the dog down with a yelp. The puppy quickly scampered away. Michelle stared at the Christmas tree decorated with doggy treats, unable to get the ad out of her mind. She'd thought Austin was so different. She held a hand over her heart, trying to contain the pain. Why had she thought this time would be any different? She fumbled for her phone, dialing Ruth's number with trembling fingers. Hello, Ruth said. Did you see it? Michelle asked. Yes. What do you think of Austin O'Neill's character now? Michelle closed her eyes, barely holding back a whimper. We have to organize a protest, capitalize on the media attention. I'm already on it. We're meeting at Wellsprings Pharmaceutical at 10 tomorrow morning. Can you be there? Yes, Michelle said and hung up the phone. Lola nudged Michelle's arm with her nose, and Michelle pulled the dog close, giving her a kiss on the top of her head. I shouldn't have lost sight of my goals because of a man, she told her. Michelle wouldn't make that same mistake twice. Chapter 14 Austin stared at the closed door, his world shattering. He'd asked for time to explain. He wanted to explain, was desperate to explain. But the FBI had instructed him not to tell a soul until the raid was complete. Michelle had turned into a completely different person at the first sign of conflict, just like Victoria. Maybe it was for the best that this had happened. The children liked Michelle, but they weren't overly attached to her, yet. This way, he was the only one who got hurt. He wanted a relationship with someone who trusted him. Apparently, that woman wasn't Michelle. Austin slowly walked to his car, hoping Michelle would open her door and beg him to stay, but she didn't. He'd gone over the paperwork for hours last night before making the call. In the end, he hadn't been able to escape the truth. The lab reports he had found in company archives didn't match up with the altered copies submitted to the FDA. Wellsprings had knowingly lied to the Food and Drug Administration about the results of the anti-seizure medication lab tests. He'd had to turn them in. Austin had expected that to be the end of it, but someone from the FBI contacted him a mere hour later and asked to meet with him the next morning. Apparently this went deeper than FDA violations. When the news had broken that afternoon, an FBI agent had called Austin. Somehow wires got crossed at the two agencies, and the FDA announced their findings prematurely. The agent asked Austin to keep all information to himself until the FBI raid could be completed. Already the agency worried they had lost the element of surprise, and evidence would be destroyed as the company executives panicked. One week, and he could have explained everything to Michelle. But apparently he wasn't worth the wait. Austin stayed up well past midnight, submitting resumes to other companies and filling out online applications. 
Whatever happened with Wellsprings, he couldn't stay at the company after this. If luck was on his side, Mark would never find out he'd been the leak. But his electronic stamp was all over the documents and he knew it was only a matter of time. What a way to kick off Christmas break. A text came from Mark the next morning, demanding they meet at the office immediately. Austin crawled out of bed, dread curling in his stomach. Proof of infidelity meant Victoria hadn't taken much in the divorce, but the move had made a decent dent in his savings account. Still, if they cut out the extras and laid off the housekeeper, they'd be fine as long as finding a new job didn't take more than six months. He had the kids, and that was the most important thing. They had been fine before they met Michelle, and they'd move on just fine without her. Had it really only been three weeks since she'd entered their lives? Losing her shouldn't hurt so much. The park strip at the entrance of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical teemed with protesters hoisting picket signs. Austin drove slowly by the crowd, the dark tint of his car windows allowing him to search for Michelle without fear of being seen. She stood near the middle of the pack, her face drawn in an angry scowl. Her coat bulged in front, and he saw one chocolate-colored paw before driving past. He couldn't blame Michelle for protesting Wellsprings. Part of Austin wanted to pick up a sign and join her. But she had refused to trust him when he asked for time to explain, and that wasn't something he could look past. Austin badged into the building, wondering if security would escort him out. The sounds of the protesters died as soon as the double-pane revolving door swung shut. The silence of the reception area crept over Austin, and he fought the urge to shiver. He'd never been to the office on a Saturday. Apparently, firing him was important enough that Mark was willing to interrupt his weekend. Come in, please, Mark said, his tone unusually formal. He shut the office door and motioned to the woman sitting next to the large black desk. I've asked Jean from HR to be here for this meeting. Austin sank into a chair, peace washing over him. He knew what was coming, and he wasn't going to try and stop it. He'd made his choice last night. Given the opportunity, he'd make the same one again. We know you tipped off the FDA, Mark said. Austin kept quiet, neither confirming nor denying the accusation. Why would you do that? Mark continued, his voice raising. After everything we've done for you, why would you turn on us? That's so not cool, man. Heat licked up Austin's neck, but he tried to keep his tone even and steady. If you choose not to follow the laws and guidelines set up by the FDA, that isn't my fault. Mark's face turned purple with rage, but when he spoke, his voice was low and cool. You have officially been terminated from Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, effective immediately. And what is the reason for the termination? Austin demanded. Informing the FDA you're breaking the law? Severely impaired judgment, Mark bit out. You should have approved that ad campaign and you didn't. That ad campaign is borderline suicidal, Austin said. It's not even accurate. The majority of pharmaceutical drugs are tested on mice and rats, and rabbits sometimes, but rarely dogs. That's cosmetic companies. The public doesn't know that, Mark said. You're done. Pack up your stuff and get out. The door burst open and Austin sprang to his feet, heart pounding. The woman from HR screamed, Police! A person in full body gear, an FBI logo stamped across his chest, pointed a gun in their direction. Hands in the air! Austin immediately raised his hands, and Mark reluctantly did the same. A moment later, a federal officer, the one Austin had given his statement to, walked up to him. You can put your hands down and come with me, the officer said quietly. Austin dropped his hands, relief pouring through him. Michelle hated him. He had been fired. The FBI was investigating Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. His part was over. For the next hour, Austin sat in his office. Former office, he reminded himself, with an agent, while federal officers swarmed the building, searching every nook and cranny. Austin knew he should feel devastated. He had just been fired for the first time ever. 
but calm blanketed him. He didn't regret turning Wellsprings in. He could at least thank Michelle for helping him see what an awful company he worked for. Hopefully, if the government hadn't frozen the company's accounts, he'd receive a severance package since he hadn't quit. The door swung open and Austin looked up. Suspects have been arrested and the building searched, an officer said. The media has already gathered and the press conference starts in five. Thank you, the agent sitting across from Austin said. The officer nodded and left. So that's it? Austin asked. The agent nodded. For you, at least. Our part is just beginning. We can't thank you enough for being so cooperative. He held out a hand and Austin shook it. Care to listen to the press conference? This is your moment of glory. I'd prefer that you keep my name out of it, Austin said. The agent raised an eyebrow. Are you sure you deserve the credit? I'm sure, Austin said. He didn't want the glory or the potential complications that might arise when searching for a new job if his name was in the press. Companies tended to frown on turncoats, even if Wellsprings had been in the wrong. Knowing he saved a lot of animals from harm was good enough. Outside, a podium had been brought in with mics from three different news stations attached. Austin slipped into the crowd of picketers and reporters, keeping near the back. He scanned the crowd, searching for Michelle. She stood a mere two feet away from the podium. Her mocha-colored hair spilled down her back, a sign propped against one shoulder. She hadn't even needed to wait a week for the truth, just a few hours. Now that the raid was over, he could have told her everything. Michelle glanced back as though sensing someone watching her. She found him quickly and her lips pursed into a thin line. Austin folded his arms, the anger on her face cutting him to the core. She spun back around, facing the front once more. An FBI agent stepped up to the podium and thanked the reporters for coming. He led with a prepared statement, then opened it up to questions. Who tipped you off to the illegal practices? One of the reporters asked. The FBI agent looked at Austin for a moment, then away. A brave employee of Wellsprings Pharmaceutical contacted us only yesterday about the situation. He risked everything, not the least of which was his career, to bring justice to these animals. We owe our entire investigation to this whistleblower. Can you tell us his name? Someone else asked. He's asked to remain anonymous at this time, the agent said. Next question. A head bobbed above the crowd, Michelle on tiptoes. She found him again and raised an eyebrow. Even across a crowd of people, he could see her pleading eyes. Was it you, she seemed to ask? He nodded. Chapter 15 Whistleblower Michelle held Austin's gaze, but his face could have been carved from stone. He folded his arms, his expression revealing nothing. She had made a horrible, awful mistake. Her mind replayed their conversation from last night, each word taking on new meaning. He'd asked her to trust him, and she'd flipped out. There had to be a way to fix this. The FBI agent ended the press conference. Reporters called after him, pressing forward as he disappeared inside Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. Michelle pushed her way through the crowd, a fish trying to swim upstream. Lola squirmed inside her coat, then settled back into sleep. Michelle had to get to Austin. She shoved between two burly men with cameras and finally broke free. Austin was already halfway across the parking lot. Austin! she yelled. He kept walking, hands deep in coat pockets. She quickened her pace, her long legs quickly covering ground. He pulled keys out of his pocket and the lights on his Land Rover flashed. Please, Michelle said, raising her voice even higher. He stopped, hand on the vehicle's door. Then he turned around, his shoulders near his ears as tension rippled through his body. Hope flared in Michelle's heart. At least he hadn't climbed in his car and drove away. Yet. She skidded to a stop three feet away from him, arms still around a sleeping Lola. I'm sorry, 
I should have trusted you. I should have let you explain. His eyes were two dark pawns hiding emotions she was scared to read. I told you the ad campaign wasn't approved by me. I know. I'm so sorry. I kept thinking about Bella and those poor rabbits and I lost it. I've been in that relationship, Michelle. The one where I can't trust my partner and she doesn't trust me. I won't put my kids through that again. I won't put myself through that. A tear slipped down her cheek and Michelle quickly swiped it away. I should have never questioned you. I know who you are, Austin. I know your character. I let my emotions cloud my reasoning. Her voice caught. You're the guy who goes into work late so he can walk his daughter to class on her first day because she's scared. The guy who helps someone in need then, when she goes crazy and yells at you, sends her flowers because you know she's having a hard day. You're the guy that buys her a puppy so she isn't lonely. And I'm falling for that guy, Austin. Hard. He folded his arms, eyes hooded and unsure. I can't be with someone who doesn't trust me. It isn't healthy for anyone involved. Constantly questioning your partner's motives destroys a relationship. I should know. Please, Michelle whispered. Give me another chance. I'm so sorry. I asked for one week and you slammed the door in my face. I know. He reached out, his hand dropping just short of caressing her cheek. She wanted to grab that hand and never let go. I'm not sure I can recover from this. I was ready to pursue a relationship with you, but now I'm questioning everything. I have three other people to think about when making these decisions. Right now, I'm not sure what the best choice is. I need time. He'd asked her for it last night, and refusing had potentially ruined everything. Michelle nodded struggling not to cry and took a step back. She wanted to ask how much time, but didn't want to push him. Give me a few days, Austin said, as though reading her thoughts. I promise we'll talk then. Okay, Michelle whispered. Austin gave her a sad smile, then climbed into his car. They had a real tangible connection, more real than anything she'd ever experienced. She watched Austin's taillights disappear around the corner, her insides shredded at the thought of losing him forever. Had she just said goodbye to the only man she had ever really fallen for? Michelle stumbled to her car and slipped inside. Her phone was in her hand, Austin's number on the caller ID before she realized what she was doing. She quickly erased his number and input Hudson's instead. She couldn't ignore Austin's request for time again. Hello? Hudson? Michelle choked out. I need you. Shell, what's wrong? Austin, she said, her entire body shuddering with repressed tears. I've ruined everything. Where are you? Wellsprings Pharmaceutical, but I'm heading home. Meet you there, Hudson said, and the phone clicked dead. Michelle arrived home to Hudson standing in her driveway. She cut the car engine and he threw open her door. What happened? He demanded. She collapsed into his arms, tears burning her eyes. I finally found the guy I want to have a relationship with and I've ruined everything. Shh, Hudson said, stroking her hair. Jeez, you're shivering. Let's go inside. I want to hear the whole story. I'm such an idiot. Michelle unlocked the back door and unlatched the seatbelt from Lola's harness. This puppy was proof that Austin cared. That kind of emotion didn't disappear in a single conversation. Who's this? Hudson asked. Meet Lola. Michelle raised one of the dog's paws in a wave. You got a new dog and didn't tell me? Michelle frowned. Had she really not told Hudson? She unlocked the front door as she thought back over the last week. When had they last spoken? I guess I did. Austin gave her to me. Whoa, back up and tell me everything. I'm making hot cocoa. 
An hour later, Michelle had caught Hudson up on the entire story. She stared into her now empty mug, feeling the weight of Hudson's gaze. I ruined everything, didn't I? she asked. Hudson blew out a breath. You kind of overreacted, yeah, but I bet Austin would have too if the situation was reversed. I'll bet Austin never overreacts. She pushed the mug away, letting out a shaky sigh. I don't think we'll be able to get past this. You really love him, don't you? The mug clattered against the countertop and Michelle quickly righted it. What? No, I mean, we barely know each other. There's definitely an attraction there and I think it's mutual, but it's too soon to call it love. Hudson raised an eyebrow. I wouldn't be so sure. It's not like that. Shell, we've known each other since we were babies. I probably know you better than you know yourself. Michelle snorted. That's a little generous. I've watched you pine over countless crushes through the years. This is different. I don't know. You're totally gone on this guy, Hudson interrupted. Want to know how I'm so sure? Okay, Michelle said, her voice a squeak. Because you didn't call me when you adopted Lola. Michelle let those words sink in. Hudson had been her go-to person for years, but she hadn't even thought to text him in nearly a week. Had she shifted to relying on Austin? You've always come to me with everything, Shell. This time, you're going to someone else. That means something. Okay, Michelle said, her voice breaking. So maybe I'm falling for him. But what do I do now? Everything is such a mess, and this relationship would be so complicated. Complicated has never stopped you before. Fight for him, Shell. If he's man enough to win your heart, and I think he is, then he's worth the effort. Chapter 16 Austin clenched the steering wheel, fighting the urge to take a left, drive to Michelle's home, and wrap her in his arms. Speaking with her had knocked down his defenses, leaving him vulnerable and longing for things to return to how they had been only 24 hours ago. He'd liked where they stood then, liked how their relationship was progressing. But he had already been through a relationship with a complete lack of trust, and he wasn't willing to put himself or his children through that again. He needed time to think, to regroup and decide where his life should go from here. What was he going to tell the kids? Austin pulled into the garage and took a deep breath, glancing at the clock. He'd been gone almost four hours, twice as long as he liked leaving Mariah in charge. The garage door opened and Mariah peered out. Dad? Austin got out of the car. Hi, honey. She folded her arms, her forehead scrunching together. You've been gone a long time. I was worried. I'm really sorry about that. Something came up at work and I couldn't get away. Is everything okay? He gave her a smile he hoped was reassuring. It will be. Go get your brother and sister. We need to talk. Twenty minutes later, Austin had given them the child-appropriate version of events. He studied each of their expressions, wanting so badly to wipe away the concern he saw there. So you don't have a job anymore, Mariah said. Not at the moment, Austin confirmed, but I've got a lot of contacts in the business. I'm sure I'll find something new soon. Does this mean we'll have to move again? Spencer asked. Austin placed a hand on his son's shoulder and gave it a gentle squeeze. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm glad you helped those animals. Sydney jumped up from the couch and wrapped her arms tightly around Austin's neck. I bet Miss Collins is, too. I love you, Daddy. Austin pressed a hand into his stinging eyes. How would the kids react if he and Michelle ended up parting ways? How would they react if he decided to press forward? They talked for another ten minutes, and Austin answered their questions as honestly as he could while still keeping a positive spin on the situation. Sydney suggested they watched Christmas movies, 
and Austin spent the rest of the afternoon and evening cuddling on the couch with his children, fighting memories of Michelle. After the children were asleep, Austin booted up his computer and started emailing contacts. Despite the late hour, a recruiter immediately emailed him back with some promising leads and a request for a phone interview the following week. Austin leaned back in his chair, staring at the email. Things were always slow around the holidays, but he was confident he'd find a new job, the right job, soon. The recruiter had mentioned a nearby hospital searching for a new marketing director. The job sounded practically perfect on paper, but then so had Wellsprings Pharmaceutical. This time, Austin would ask the hard questions and follow his gut. If nothing else, Michelle had taught him that. He pulled his cell phone out of his pocket to check the time and realized the battery had died. Austin grabbed a charger from his desk drawer and plugged it in, waiting for it to boot back up. Three missed texts and a voicemail, all from Victoria. Ah, yes, the infamous friend from Yorba Linda. No doubt she had seen the news coverage and called Victoria to tattle. Austin stared at his phone, wondering if he really wanted to deal with Victoria tonight. He'd already had to deal with Michelle. Wasn't that enough? Why did he always fall for women who were all wrong for him? He sighed, dialing Victoria's number. Might as well get it over with. Did you seriously get fired? She demanded. Right to her problem with him, just like always. I think you gave up the right to ask that question when you left me for another man, Austin said evenly. Victoria let out a curse. As long as our children live with you, I have a right to know. Do you have any idea how inconsiderate that was, Austin? Did you even think of how this would affect me? You know that I can't take the kids right now. I'm leaving for Brazil in less than a month. The kids aren't going anywhere, Austin said, anger making him sweat. He unfastened the top button of his shirt. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Right, you'll take care of it, Victoria said. What am I supposed to do in six months when you've lost the house and are facing eviction? Roberto and I will be in a tiny apartment in Brazil. There's no room for the kids there and getting visas for everyone will be a nightmare. I can't believe you'd do this to me, Austin. Me, me, me. That's all Victoria had ever been concerned about. But Michelle hadn't been upset because he hurt her. She'd been mad because she believed he was misrepresenting the animals. I should have known something like this would happen, Victoria continued. I mean, my father had to give you a job when we were married. He's the only reason you were successful, and without him, you're falling on your face. He would have hired me regardless of who I was married to, Austin said through clenched teeth. I propelled his company to the next level. Right, she said, venom dripping from her voice. Austin let her rant, the hateful words washing over him. This was nothing like what had happened with Michelle. He couldn't imagine her ever speaking to him this way. He thought back to their fight last night. She had asked hard questions and she had asked him to leave, but she hadn't belittled him. They'd only known each other for three weeks. If the tables had been turned and he'd overheard misinformation about Michelle, would he have trusted her enough to not interpret things badly? Probably not. Austin closed his eyes as Victoria yelled, letting every encounter with Michelle flit through his mind. She was nothing like Victoria. Comparing the two women was like saying spam and a pork roast were the same dish. Michelle cared deeply about others. She was deeply committed to everything in her life. She had a passion that he was constantly in awe of. A passion for teaching. A passion for children. A passion for animals. A passion for life. And he was falling in love with her. He had to get her back. Victoria, I've got to go, Austin said. What? You have got to be... Austin hung up, not waiting for her to finish that sentence. He pulled up Michelle's number and quickly sent her a text. Can I see you tomorrow? My place at seven. 
The response was almost immediate, breathing hope into his battered soul. Okay. Austin set down his phone, a new kind of apprehension filling him. Would she give him a second chance? He would beg her on his knees if that's what it took. She was worth whatever effort it took to make things right. Less than 24 hours until their meeting, he had to figure out how to win back Michelle. Chapter 17 The last 24 hours had been positively miserable. After Hudson left, Michelle had curled up on the couch, Lola sleeping in her lap, and thought about Austin, what she wanted from their relationship, what he meant to her. Did she love him? She'd never been in love before, but this ache in her heart certainly felt stronger than a crush. Michelle spent three hours getting ready for their meeting, obsessively changing outfits and fiddling with her hair and makeup. Texts were so cryptic. She had no idea what to expect from this meeting. Could you break up with someone you'd never really dated? By the time she arrived at Austin's, she had decided that whatever the outcome tonight, she wasn't going down without a fight. She'd finally found her person, that other half that made her finally feel whole. She wouldn't, couldn't walk away from that without at least trying to make it work. It took all of her courage to walk up to Austin's door. Someone had strung twinkling white Christmas lights around the porch, and three painted snowmen made out of two-by-fours stood next to the door. Michelle did a double-take. With their red scarves, they looked remarkably similar to the snowmen at the entrance of her subdivision. She took a deep breath, then knocked, jostling the evergreen wreath so that the bells in it jingled. Nerves ping-ponged in her stomach, and she shoved her hands in her coat pocket to stop them from shaking. He couldn't be breaking up with her. The chemistry between them was too tangible, their connection too strong. There were a lot of reasons why a relationship between them might be challenging, but there were just as many reasons why it would be the best thing to happen in their lives. The door swung open and Michelle curled her hands into fists inside her pockets. Dim light from the hallway silhouetted Austin, making his hair glow like gold, and her stomach did a flip. He wore dark jeans and a red sweater, and she realized it was the first time she'd seen him in anything but a suit and tie. Casual looked more than good on him. Hi, Austin said, his voice flowing over her like warm honey. Thanks for coming. Of course, Michelle said. Austin took a step back, and she slipped inside. Down the hallway, she could just make out the twinkle of Christmas lights in the living room. You look beautiful tonight, Austin said from behind. Michelle shivered, his warm breath cascading over her neck. If she turned around, she could fall into his arms without any effort. Thanks, she said. Apparently, the black and white dress with the red cardigan had been the right choice. You look nice, too. Austin took a few steps down the hallway. I thought we could sit in the living room and talk. Okay. Michelle followed him down the eerily quiet hallway. Where are the kids? Lucy took them to a movie. They'll be back in about two hours. The front entryway opened into the living room, and Michelle gasped. The entire space had been transformed. Garland lined the fireplace mantel, where an elegant porcelain nativity was nestled in a bed of angel's hair. A twelve-foot-high Christmas tree cast multicolored lights across the bay window, filling the space and making the room feel warm and cozy. You decorated, Michelle said. The kids helped me this morning. I couldn't let them wake up Christmas morning with no tree for the presents to go under. Michelle walked over to the tree, her heart melting at the obviously homemade ornaments. She touched a salt clay handprint that had been decorated to look like Santa. A school project? She guessed. Her class had done something similar a few years ago as a present for the parents. Spencer's. Austin stood a few paces back, hands in his pockets as he watched her intently. Third grade. A lot of people prefer trees with expensive department store decorations, 
but I've always loved trees that tell something about the family they belong to. That's what I thought the first time I saw your tree. A rueful grin flitted across Austin's lips. Doggy treats. I was instantly enchanted. Michelle looked away, her mouth suddenly dry. Was enchanted, as in the past tense. Let's sit. Michelle nodded, taking a seat on the edge of the sectional. Austin sat as well, leaving a few feet of space between them, but angling his body toward hers. It was now or never. Michelle took a deep breath, then plunged. Austin, I am so incredibly sorry for jumping to conclusions. I was completely out of line, and you were right to call me out for it. No, I was out of line. Austin reached forward, grasping both of her hands in his. Michelle's heart thudded in her chest as her knees trembled. Did he mean... My relationship with Victoria was never good. When you questioned me, it brought up a lot of negative memories from arguments I had with her. I was terrified I had made an error in judgment once again. It was a knee-jerk reaction, Michelle said quickly. With Bella's death, the timing was a perfect storm that I should have known better than to get sucked into. I know that now. And honestly, if the tables were turned, I don't know that I would have reacted any differently. You aren't Victoria, and it isn't fair to you or to myself to compare the two relationships. I kept expecting you to bail, just like every other guy. We both made mistakes. His grip on her hands tightened and the tingles in her stomach grew. I don't want to make mistakes with you, Michelle. You make me want to be a better man. The tears did overflow then, and she quickly pulled one hand free to wipe them away. What's wrong? Austin asked, concern clouding his face. I'm just so, so grateful for you. You risked your career to alert the FDA and save those animals. Yeah, about that. Do you know anyone hiring? Michelle gasped. You quit? More like got fired. Apparently, companies don't like it when you turn their secrets over to governmental agencies. Michelle reached out, resting her hand on his cheek. Austin leaned into it, and she stared into his face in wonder. Do you have any idea how incredible you are? Me? You're the one that's incredible. I'm all in, Michelle. I know a relationship with me comes with a lot of baggage. I'm unemployed, I have trust issues, an ex-wife that loves to interfere, and three incredible children that will have to come first. But despite having the deck stacked against us, I know we can make it work. I want to make it work. He placed his hand over hers, which still rested on his cheek. Can we just agree to start over? Oh, please, yes. Austin chuckled, pulling her in for a tight hug. She clung to him, inhaling his Christmassy scent. Do you have any idea how crazy I am about you? He whispered. When I picked Sydney up from school that first day and you were so direct and unapologetic, I knew I was in trouble. And then you breezed in here with your caramel popcorn and Christmas movies, making my children laugh, and I was a goner. Was it possible for a heart to explode from happiness? For me, it was when you rushed Bella to the vet, no questions asked. I knew then that you weren't the bad guy I kept trying to cast you as. He rested his forehead against hers, his minty breath wafting over her. I'm falling for you, Michelle Collins, and I don't want to stop. Michelle closed her eyes, happiness flooding through her. The feeling is mutual. Austin let his eyes flick up, and Michelle followed his gaze. A sprig of mistletoe hung just above the couch, the red of the berries contrasting with the green of the leaves. Michelle's mind flashed back to the night they met, and giddy anticipation filled her. Oh, look, Austin said, his voice low and gravelly with emotion. 
mistletoe. Michelle laughed, resting a hand on his chest. I wonder how that got there. My money's on the elves, Austin whispered. His eyes searched hers, asking a question she was more than willing to answer. Michelle moved her hands to the back of his neck. That seemed to be all the encouragement he needed. He leaned down, his lips pressing against hers. Michelle urged him closer, her lips parting in a silent invitation he was more than willing to accept. Her head swirled, but this time it wasn't from champagne. The reality of a future with Austin was more intoxicating than any alcohol. His kiss was every bit as delicious as she remembered. I think I love you, he whispered, his lips brushing against hers. Is this what love feels like? Michelle asked. If so, I'm a big fan. He laughed, lowering his head to hers once again. They had at least an hour until the children would return, and she intended to enjoy every second of it. Austin was her own Christmas miracle, and she would never take him for granted again. About the Author Lindsay Armstrong is the number one best-selling author of the No Match for Love series and Sunset Plains Romance series. In case it wasn't obvious, she's always had a soft spot for love stories. In third grade, she started secretly reading romance novels, hiding the cover so no one would know because, hello, embarrassing, and dreaming of her own Prince Charming. Lindsay finally met her true love while at college, where she graduated with a bachelor's in history education. They are now happily married and raising twin boys in the Rocky Mountains. Like any true romantic, Lindsay loves chick flicks, ice cream, and chocolate. She believes in sigh-worthy kisses and happily ever afters, and loves expressing that through her writing. To find out about future releases, you can join Lindsay's VIP Readers Club. You can also find her on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or her website, lindsayarmstrong.com. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please take a few minutes and leave a review. This is the best way you can say thank you to an author and narrator. It helps others discover audiobooks they might enjoy. Thank you. For more information on the narrator, Tiffany Williams, look for her on Facebook, Twitter, and at airbendingmediaproductions.com. This has been Mistletoe Match, No Match for Love, written by Lindsay Armstrong, narrated by Tiffany Williams, produced by Airbending Media Productions, LLC, copyright 2016 by Lindsay Armstrong, production copyright 2016 by Lindsay Armstrong.